燃え上がれガンダム<音楽>シュートガンダムポッドキャスト brought to you by the folks at the weekly stuff podcast。I'm your host Sean Chapman。and I'm Jonathan Lack。and we are here once again。Jonathan to talk about mobile suit Gundam。this time on the show we are talking about。mobile suit Gundam unicorn the OVA series。made from 2010 to 2014 that is set。in the 90s of the universal century so it's set。While made way, way after the last Gundam we talked about, Shars Counterattack, it is set in the timeline、um, about 10 years after that movie.、So、no, just three years. While,、uh, oh, yeah, Shars no, Counter-、right. uh, yeah, yeah. Shars Counterattack is UC 93 and Unicorn is 96. It feels like Shars Counterattack should have happened longer ago than considering where Zeon is and stuff like that. So I, the timeline, the Gundam timeline gets weird、um, after Shars Counterattack when you start sh- sh- shoving stuff into UC. But yeah, so it's set after Shars Counterattack.、Um, this is the first non Tomino made、uh, Gundam show we're doing a full deep dive in on this podcast. While we've addressed some of the OVAs that he was not directly involved in for a main topic, this is the first time we're doing non Tomino. So we've decided to go kind of chronological because Unicorn Gundam is very, very, very concerned with the events of the original shows and Shars Counterattack. It has like. Characters that recur from that, it has、uh, concepts that recur from that, plot threads that recur from that. So it makes sense to, to do this. And then after this, we will go back in time and forward in time、um, and re hook up to the chronological Gundam. But for today, we're doing Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn and then also the narrative Gundam movie、um, that was made、uh, and released in Japan just last year. Yes, a narrative Gundam is a direct sequel to Unicorn. It takes place in UC 97 and is based, you can almost think of it as like an eighth episode of the OVA because it's even, it's actually one minute shorter than the final episode of Unicorn Gundam, which I find kind of funny.、Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's got different characters, but it is a, a direct sequel to Unicorn. So we're going to talk about all of that today. And Sean, I have not been this excited to do an episode of Weekly Suit Gundam since. I think since episode two, when we talked about Garma's death, <laughs>、uh-huh. and I was like, I need to talk about this because Sean,、uh, Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn is my favorite Gundam show since the original.、Uh, at least if you're going like full series, I think War in the Pocket would also be up there for me, obviously, but it's a, it's a little side thing that's basically like a movie, you know?、Um, mm-hmm. But if you're talking about the, the sequels to the original, Zeta, Double Zeta, Shars Counterattack, and then Unicorn, Unicorn is my favorite of those. You all know I love the other ones. That's in no way to put those down or anything, obviously. It's just Unicorn Gundam hit me where I live. I love it deeply and dearly. I love everything about it. I watched it about two weeks ago, and I have not been able to get it off my mind, even as I have. Moved ahead, and I've watched some of the stuff we'll be talking about later because I'm, I'm working through some of that. But、uh, Unicorn Gundam, just I, I think about it kind of all the time now. I am astonished, and especially considering it was a weird running joke in the early episodes of Weekly Suit Gundam、mm-hmm. that you would say, Oh, yeah, and then there's this show Unicorn Gundam, and I would stop you and be like, Wait, there's a show called Unicorn Gundam, and I forgot I said that, and then I said it again, because it is, to an outsider, extremely strange that there is a show called Gundam Unicorn.、Uh, but I think it's one of the best things in the whole Gundam franchise. I fucking love it. Yeah, this will be an interesting podcast to do because, I, because while I really like Unicorn Gundam a lot, I don't think I like it as much as, as you do quite. And, and while I'll get into why, because I think. There's a, there's a couple of reasons why I don't have quite the powerful response to it.、Um, but it is really phenomenally done. It's, it is a thing that, like, 
should not work at all if you look at the stuff it does like it has a clone of char in it that is an idea that should not work in the slightest and they fucking 100 percent nail it like the entire plot of the show is basically like a treasure hunt for a MacGuffin, um yes. which is for gundam i think a very awkward fit in terms of a plot structure that normally i would think that's not a kind of plot structure that should work in gundam particularly for like if it was one Gundam movie, that would make sense. This, this is like a, basically the length of a full TV show, more or less, in uh, split into seven parts, into seven movie length OVAs. Um, and so with that, I would think normally the whole Laplace's box concept, that probably shouldn't work. Um, and so like those ideas, you th you'd think that Unicorn Gundam would, if not be a failure, be like a much like more kind of safe, duller Gundam project than what it ends up being, which is a really remarkable, really smart, um, sharp continuation of the stuff that um, the original sort of, you know, three shows and culminating movie, Char's Counterattack, um, the themes and ideas that those shows bring up. Unicorn Gundam is a really interesting, well, well thought out follow up to everything that came before it in that sense. Absolutely. And I think what I respond to so strongly is that element of it that is a sequel. It is a direct sequel to the original saga made 30 years later and by different people, largely. Yeah. And I actually think, you know, we, when we talked about Zeta Gundam, Sean, did a lot of talking about how Zeta Gundam made us think of the recent Star Wars sequels made by Disney and how Zeta provides such a good template that the Star Wars sequels really have not fully... Like, it, it, it's a better version of what they've been trying to do, you know? Yeah. And I actually think Unicorn Gundam is the even better comparison because it is the one made 30 years later by a different group of people that is in such active conversation. Like, I was, I've, I wrote a lot of notes on this, and one thing I wrote, Sean, is that it kind of, it's such a metatextual journey that Unicorn Gundam goes on. And it feels like it's not just a reaction to the major themes of Tomino's original saga, but almost a narrative essay on that saga. That's kind of what it feels like to me. And that is such a smart idea for a sequel. I think because Unicorn Gundam, we should mention, was originally a series of light novels. And so it was written in novel form and then adapted into TV, um, basically into movies. There's there's a certain boldness and a weirdness to what it tries, and you summarized that for a little uh, us for that uh, for us a little bit just a little bit ago, Sean, when you're saying like it does a clone of Char and it does what I've thought of as like the big Arthurian quest where yeah. like there's a mystery of Laplace's box and the Unicorn Gundam is sort of like Excalibur and Banager Lynx has to prove his worth by moving between factions and and proving he is worthy and all this stuff. It's very Arthurian mythical and it feels like something I don't think you would ever. Write for TV if you were sitting down to write a Gundam TV show, but because it came out of a series of novels, it's got this very, and it's got a very novelistic depth and pace to it, I think. And it is just so vastly different while also being such an interesting complement and reaction to all that other stuff. And then this is also, I think, going to be a big crux of our discussion today, Sean, is how it tackles new type stuff, because mm -hmm. I like all the new type stuff in Gundam I've seen so far. But I think you and I had both agreed the best new type stuff was the last five episodes of the original Gundam and particularly the episode A Cosmic Glow, yeah. which is where Lala dies and Amuro first sees the tears of time, we could say. And I think Unicorn Gundam takes pretty much all of its cues for the new type stuff from original Gundam. It feels way more in line with a cosmic glow than it does any of like the cyber new type stuff or some of the other things they do in Zeta and Double Zeta, which I also really like. But there's something about how they push it to the max and they go to some of those same experimental 2001-esque places with it. And it feels like a really beautiful celebration of critique of commentary on everything Tomino and company did in the original saga and it's just even if I might like it more than you I think you and I would both agree it's utterly essential viewing if you have watched the original Gundam saga right oh yeah no it is not it is not one of those Gundam shows that it's like uh oh, you can kind of skip it if you don't want to yeah it is if you have enjoyed Gundam you should watch Unicorn Gundam it is fan fucking tastic and it's, it's weird because it is a show with a high buy-in. I think you have to have seen most of Gundam to get it. Like, you have to have seen the original three shows. Don't skip Double Zeta. We've said that many times. 
You definitely have to have seen Shars Counterattack. So altogether, that's about 150 episodes of TV plus a movie. You probably should have seen the three Gundam compilation movies from the original Gundam, which we'll get to for very specific reasons later. Yeah. So we're talking 150 episodes plus four movies, I think, to really get Unicorn Gundam. And so on the one hand, like, there's a really... That's probably the heaviest buy-in for any single Gundam show to watch, right? Because, like, past this point, with a lot of what we're going to be talking about, Sean, like, I know Victory Gundam is not that tied in. To everything no, else. you can watch Victory Gundam on its own without knowing anything else about Gundam, and you will. There's there's nothing in that show that you will not really get. There's like re, some new type reference stuff would be helpful, um, but it's you know I mean you've seen Gundam F ninety one. Do you have to have seen anything Gundam yeah. to like understand what's happening in F ninety one? No, because having seen a lot of Gundam, I don't understand most of what happened in F ninety one. Exactly, that's not the problem with that movie at all. It's yeah. not a so yeah. And so then, past this point, Gundam is not sort of uh, Tomino's work in Gundam never like is backwards looking at this from this point forward. Like everything he does is always like something new that has almost no connection to old stuff, or the connections are very like broad and fleeting. And of course, if you go to alternate universe Gundam, none of those shows require buy-in unless they are a sequel to another show like Seed Destiny to Seed or something. But yeah. like. For Unicorn Gundam, you have to have seen a lot. And that's kind of the downside to get to it. But I feel like it is the pot of gold at the end of the long Gundam rainbow in that if you get there, there are very, very, very few stories or TV shows I can think of, Sean, that are doing as much active like payoff and look back at something you have watched and absorbed and loved as much as Unicorn Gundam. Because it is actively like doing a lot of paying off and recontextualizing and commentary on all of this TV you've watched, 150 episodes, all this crazy stuff. And I think that makes it also just kind of a beautiful, unique thing in its own right. Um, so yeah, I, I am so excited to talk about it. I also know when we get to the movie Narrative Gundam, I liked that more than you did on that one too. Um, not obviously as important as the main Unicorn Gundam show, but I'm excited to talk about all of it. I fucking love this show. And... Before we forget about it, I just have to say, Sean, on the previous episode of Weekly Suit Gundam, when we talked about Shara's yes. counterattack, I said, man, I'm, I'm bummed I've seen all of Shuichi Ikeda's work as Shara in Gundam. And I, Sean, I told you this off the air, but I have to tell it to the people. I want to stand up and applaud you for how delicately you tiptoed around your response in cluing me in that... Maybe Ikeda's not quite done, but not spoiling for me that there's a full-on fucking Char clone inexplicably named Full Frontal in Unicorn mm. Gundam. <laughs> yeah, it was because because when you said that, I immediately was like reflexively went to correct you and realized that, oh wait, shit, he's like literally about to watch Unicorn Gundam. I cannot say that Shuichi Ikeda is one of the main characters in Unicorn Gundam because that would tip too much. Because it is one of, like, the great surprises of watching that. Because I had no idea that, like, I had heard that there was a character named Full Frontal, but I didn't know anything about him. Yeah, I'm me just too. like, that's a great name. Um, I am very excited to see who Full Frontal is. And I I hope that he's just naked the entire time. Unfortunately, he's not <laughs> naked the entire time. But yes, he is a shark clone entirely voiced by Shuichi Keita. Um, so I'm glad that I didn't accidentally spoil that for you because that would have been, that would have been sad. It's a, it's a very fun surprise, um, when that character comes on screen for the first time. Yeah. The, the second episode is called the red comet. I think the English title is different, but in Japanese, it's just Akai Suisei and you literally meet a dude who is just, he's got a different hairstyle, but a very similar hairstyle. And he looks like Char, maybe 20 years younger from Char's counterattack. Not 20, maybe like at the, at the age of like original Gundam and, and then he starts talking, and it's just Shuichi Ikeda. And it is such a glorious surprise. And man, God bless Shuichi Ikeda for always, over the last 40 years, being game to not just come back for, like, little cameos, but, like, if they need him to just do a full-throated reprise or, like, tweaking of Char, he will come back and he will hit it out of the fucking park, as evidenced most recently by the Origin series, <laughs> you know? Yeah. He is so good at it, especially because, like, it's not a role that, you know, he's doing constantly. He's not in every Gundam thing. It's not like Masako Nozawa in Dragon Ball, um, but he's always up to come back and just do phenomenal, phenomenal work. So good for Shuichi Ikeda. Absolutely. But we'll get so, to that. Yeah, before we, we dive all the way into Unicorn Gundam, I do have one. I want to make a, a small report um, because I know I, I addressed it briefly, I think, on the last episode when I was about halfway through Space Runaway Ideon, 
which is Ooh. the 1980 Tomino directed anime. It's the anime that he directed immediately after uh, Mobile Suit Gundam because back in those days, the, like anime production was an absolute factory, and you had those teams were producing literally like if they you know were popular and fully successful, 50 episode runs of anime every single year. Which if you count how many weeks there are in a year, that's just you are constantly putting out a new show. Um, so. Yeah, so I have now finished Space Runaway Edeon, and I have watched the the second movie, Space Runaway Edeon, Be Invoked, which is a very good title. Um, and yeah, so for people, so a little bit of extra context, Space Runaway Edeon, um, I think it's 38 episodes, and it kind of ran into the same situation that Gundam did, where um, on initial airing early on, it was not particularly popular, so it's got it, its total episode run um, cut down um, even more severely than Gundam's did. Uh, and but then it started accruing a cult fan base because Space Runaway Edeon gets weird as fuck in some places, and it is a super cult show. Um, and so then they got the green light to do two movies. The first movie is basically a compilation movie of the first half of the TV show, and then the second movie is um, basically this is the it's the exact same thing that um they did with neon genesis evangelion where the second movie is sort of an expanded version of the ending that already existed for the tv show in sort of a kind of retconning of that ending and so it's sort of you can kind of look at the endings as being the same thing just one is a bigger version but then they contradict each other in weird places so it's it's very like neon genesis evangelion very much followed that model um also the end of evangelion movie takes a lot of stuff from the second Edeon movie, which was something I had heard, but I was kind of surprised at how, how there's some very specific stuff that, that that end of Eva does that is very much pulled from Be Invoked. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of what Space Runway Edeon is from like a kind of production point of view. It's a really interesting show to watch because it is not anywhere near, I think, as like successful as Mobile Suit Gundam is on executing on its core premise. But the core premise for Edeon is so weird that, like, I can't imagine the show being, like, well put together in a certain way. Like, the show ends up kind of repeating a lot of ideas. It's got really kind of uneven pacing. It's got some of the same problems that other shows of that period, like Vodums and Macross, do. Of do spending probably about three or four episodes on a thing that really you only need to do one episode on. Like, it's the version of, like, if Mobile Suit Gundam had spent five episodes at Luna 2 instead of one episode at Luna 2, that's kind of what um, a lot of these shows feel like, and Edeon has that quality to it. A lot of the fights that happen in episodes feel very disposable um, in a way that, like, once you get to the kind of two-thirds way mark of the show, it starts getting a little bit dull and repetitive. But when Edeon is, like, hitting, it is it hits so hard. And there's a stretch probably from, like, episode 10 to 20 that is just fucking electric, and it's so good. And the weird sort of relationship that the main characters have to the Edeon, which is the main robot of the show, and then the solo ship, which is basically the white base of the show. It's the, the ship that they're all on, which they are artifacts left behind by an ancient alien civilization um, that they have kind of recovered. And... Uh, um, they're attacked by an alien race in the first episode, and so they have to use the Edeon and the ship to survive, and they're kind of flying through space, constantly being hounded by these, these alien attackers um, called the Buff Clan, which is a dumb fucking name that I never got used to. Um, then the Buff Clan are just basically other humans. They, they go very hard in being like, we have to make these guys aliens because... They're not letting us do Gundam again, so we can't just have people murdering other people. So we're doing aliens again. But these aliens also have a home planet that's called Earth. And boy, these aliens sure seem to be exactly like humans in almost every single regard. Um, they're not technically humans. They're just as close to being human as you could possibly make an alien species. Um, so they're, Wait, they're Sean, when you say the words buff clan, what comes yes. to mind is that bodybuilder character type in Dragon Quest games that you get, mm -hmm. who in English always talk with like a Cockney British accent. That's who in my mind you're telling me they're going around fighting in space, in Space Runway Ideon. Yeah, so they don't quite look like those guys, but that is, it is hard to talk about the buff clan or read the words buff clan, because it is B-U-F-F. -F. It is just the word buff. Um, in the sort of official English uh, translation of it. So it's, yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's a dumb, bad name, but I kind of love it. God bless um, Yoshiyuki Tomino. 
Yeah. And so the Edeon itself and the solo ship are... Like, the Edeon is ridiculously powerful as a mecha. Like, it is just, like, literally world-destroying. Like, you, it, it gets to the point where it can start blowing up planets and shit. And that's that's not, like, the last thing it does it, is it blows up a planet. Like, that's, that's like, two-thirds of the way through the show. They're like, oh, God, now we can start blowing up planets with this thing. That's kind of fucked up. Um, so the Edeon is becomes, like, really kind of frightening as a narrative concept because it is so powerful and our main characters are never never quite understand how to control it. They never quite understand why it is able to exert energy and like power in certain instances and why it doesn't in others. And so their relationship to the Edeon is really complicated. And when the show is exploring that aspect and diving a little bit deeper into the characters, it's very good. It's just that when it's like, okay, here's another episode where the Buff Clan attack the solo ship and uh, Cosmo and his friends have to get into the Edeon and, and and fend off the Buff Clan. And then at the end, someone will say something ominous about the power of the Ede. And you're like, okay, yeah, this is the fourth episode in a row that has done that. It gets very tedious. But when you get to the fucking movie, Be Invoked, that movie is nuts. I cannot fucking believe they made it. It goes to places that are like that it gets shocking in ways that like it doesn't matter like how like that kind of stuff ages in terms of like oh like you know mo more modern stuff will be more violent usually and will be more explicit with violence and it's not to say that Edeon is ever something like a saw or anything like that but it's it becomes incredibly frank with its presentation of violence and the effects of violence in a way that is still incredibly shocking um 39 years later like it's an old anime at this point and in the the main show is already much more directly violent than gundam is like they they show blood which is something that gundam almost never did um and they will like they they are able to show blood much more frequently than gundam but once they got the movie budget man they just fucking they do some awful shit to some characters that you're like i don't mm. This is another place where people who are all like Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, it's like you have no fucking idea the shit I have seen fucking watching that goddamn movie. And then the ending to the the ending to the TV show is very good, but the expanded version of like the last 10 minutes is the most 2001 a Space Odyssey Tomino has ever gotten. He leans all the way into it in a way that is um, great and perfect. So Edeon is a kind of a hard thing to recommend because I do think the TV show is pretty hard to get through because it gets very tedious for like pretty significant stretches. It has a lot of really great stuff, but sometimes it gets tedious. I have not seen the first movie that recaps the first half of the show, so I don't know if that movie is good enough to give you the buy-in on the characters for the payoff of Be Invoked to work or not. But if you're willing to kind of power through a, a show that can get pretty rough and a bit dull in places, the ultimate payoff of that movie for me was totally worth it. And and I I have been kind of what you were saying with Unicorn Gundam. I finished watching Edeon like three weeks ago or something at this point. Um, and I have been thinking about it like every day, some of the shit that that movie does. Um, so yeah, Edeon is great. It's got a great theme song also. And it's got maybe my new favorite eye catch. Um, it, upgrading from Gundam, which is the show, um, Edeon just has a full course of people just sing the word Edeon every time the eye catch comes, and it's very great. Um, they almost did that with Gundam. You can, I've, I've, I've actually used it on Weekly Suit Gundam before. There is, if you look at the complete soundtrack set that, like, gives you yeah. all of the musical cues and all of the, like, stems and everything, there was an abandoned one that they did not air where it goes, Gundamu, Gundamu, shoo! And I kind of wish they had used that one. But, um, yes, that sounds great. Sean, I have two notes on Edeon. Okay. Um, because I've been, I looked it up, and there is a very handy Blu-ray set you can get on Amazon that's all the episodes and the movies, so that's very easily legally available for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, Sean, I'm looking at the back of the box of the Blu-ray set. Does the main character in Idion have a giant red afro? Yes, Cosmo Yuki, the Amuro of Space Runaway Edeon, does have a giant red afro. And it's there's a couple of times, because he obviously he's like wearing a helmet um, when he's piloting the Edeon. Um, and sometimes when they get, he gets damaged really badly and like the Edeon's kind of taken a, a, a pulverizing, his helmet will get cracked a little bit. And sometimes his Afro like pokes through the helmet in a way that looks very funny. Um, yeah, Cosmo's a great main character because 
Um, all the main characters ha are very slow burns um, in terms of like, unlike Gundam, where I think you get invested in Amuro very, very quickly. Um, Edeon doesn't give you as much time with each individual character. It, it sort of spreads its time more evenly across the whole crew. Um, but once you start getting into Cosmo's stuff and he starts becoming more of an interesting protagonist, he's great, especially because he's always carrying around a big fucking knife. And that's just part of his just character design is he has this giant knife on his hip and he has it for the whole show because that's just what his character is, right? So they're like reusing that animation so he always has to look like that. But he doesn't do anything with that knife until like episode 12. So the whole time I'm like, does he just have a knife on his hip? Why does he always have carry around this fucking knife? And then once he gets to a certain point, then he starts doing cool shit with the knife. But it takes a very long time with this character... It's like the longest Chekhov's gun or Chekhov's knife thing I've ever seen. It's, it's literally like you've watched like two to three hours of this TV show before he does anything with this fucking buoy knife he's always carrying around. That's awesome. All right. Well, that's Space Runway Ideon. Do you want to go ahead and talk some Unicorn Gundam, Sean? Yes. So, so let's take a break from the weird other world of mecha anime and go back to our, our comfy Gundam hole and talk about Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn. I love it so much. There's so much we could talk about. It is such a jam fucking packed series. I, for myself, Sean, in my notes, I made myself summaries of all seven episodes just so I could try to remember all the crazy shit that happens. And it really is. I think it's worth stating how well paced a show this is. I think every one of the seven OVA episodes is so jam packed. They're, they move at such a clip like. This is the kind of thing where, you know, I would sit down to watch an episode and just for that hour, just glued to the TV, no impulse to stand up or go, like, look at my phone or anything. It is just completely absorbing. And they you almost all end on absolute killer, like, final moments or cliffhangers. Um, and, yeah. And they've also just got cool titles like Day of the Unicorn or At the Bottom of the Gravity Well. So there's a lot we could talk about. Where should we start, Sean? I think probably the first thing we have to establish, this is very important, how are we going to pronounce the main character's name? I am going to say it like Ride Shoei does at the end of episode 6 and 7 and just go, Banaji! Okay, so... I'm kidding, I'm not going to do that every time. Yes, but you're not going to shout it. It's, yeah. it's Banaji in my mind because that is how they say it. It is spelled Banajur. It is an Indian name, I think. Or it's just a completely made-up name. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I My instinct is to call him Banerjee, but I don't know if that's how we should say it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not sure if I could do anything other than Banerjee, which, yeah. Like, I, it, it clearly, if you look at the spelling, it's supposed to be pronounced Banager, Um, But let's just go with, like, Banerjee. Let's just stick with the Japanese. Because he is one of, there's a small handful of Gundam protagonists for whom I just cannot... I cannot just go with what the natural English pronunciation is because I've heard the name said too many times. It's like and it when you say so Garod good, like, for After War Gundam X, I don't know who you're talking about. It's Garod. Like it's just it's, it's not how you pronounce the spelling, but it's just how they say it. Yeah, no, it's it's. I was I did a little Twitter thread on this when I realized the hero of Gundam F ninety one is named C Book Arno. Yes. And I was trying to figure out who is the best Gundam protagonist name, obviously just with my frame of reference being all the UC shows. And I think Seabook is up there. I think Amuro is up there in part because of how well that name sounds sung. But I think Banaji Lynx is my favorite because of how it sounds when it is said out loud, and especially when it is screamed with righteous indignation and rage by characters like uh, Ride and and other people it is such a good name just to hear vocalized in the japanese language i honestly sean for this question i probably should have flipped over to the dub at some point and listened to how the hell they say it in the english dub mm -hmm. because that would be fascinating but i haven't um so yes he is bonaji to me yeah because because the other because yes his name is very good to to scream out in righteous fury if you're like a rite um but it's also Kind of like Amuro, they just picked a great name for Shuichi Ikeda to just growl. So yes. whenever he just says Banaji Kun, it's like yes, fucking oh my god. He's this. he's got that line in episode seven that in Japanese is something like 
you and I will go to the end of time itself, Banaji Kun. And it is, I think, one of the best Ikeda line readings in the entire franchise, which is saying something. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. So, okay. So we're agreed. We're going with, like, a rough approximation of the Japanese pronunciation for just Banaji. It's, it's too hard. It's too hard any other way. Yeah, because it's it's something where... Because I think I, that's, I like offhandedly referred to Banaji um, last time and just went with that and realized, I don't know if that's... If people will know who I... Even people who have watched Unicorn Gundam, if you, if you think of the name in English, Banaji does not... I don't think you would... I don't think you'd know who I'd be talking about if you think about the name in English. Yeah, so if like you're watching the dub or something, we're talking about the main character of Unicorn Gundam. Yeah, what so that's that? why we just had to... We just had to lay the playing field out... How are you going to say his name? We're going with Banaji, so that's yes. that's what it is. Should we just start with episode one, which is such a good like debut for this show? Uh, yeah, let me, yeah. Let's just start from the beginning and kind of go through sort of how it sets itself up, how it how it establishes its yeah. characters, because it is it's a really brilliant opening, and, and honestly, I think probably episode one is my favorite episode of Unicorn Gundam because of just how methodically it sets out all of its pieces i think is so enrapturing um that yeah when as soon as i watched it again because obviously i watched unicorn gundam when i did my full gundam watch through i did watch it again for this podcast and watching that first episode i'm like fucking goddamn they do such a good job of building every of, of sort of putting you back into the setting establishing the setting again for people who are not super familiar with it or haven't watched Gundam stuff in a long time and then just do so many subtle things to kind of set all of our characters in motion that it's a really impressive piece of writing yeah I would I would put this on the shelf with like original Gundam 79 of like how well it just gets off the ground running um mm -hmm. when we talk about it next time f91 is that's the best stretch of f91 also oh yeah um to, like i know this isn't a tomino story but it's like in the tomino style like the beginnings of those stories because zeta and double zeta do it well as well of just getting off the ground with like the crazy shit that will happen to the protagonist to draw them into this life is always great and yeah uh, but, but uh, day of the unicorn the premiere actually starts all the way in double o double zero because it yes. starts at the birth of the universal century which is very much a declaration of what kind of sweeping themes this show is going to go after because it is about the universal century itself because it is in the timeline the last story set in the actual century of the universal century before we move over to triple digits and so it goes all the way back to laplace which is where the first prime minister of the earth federation is and he is giving the speech kind of going over the charter of the universal century and what they are laying out and there is a terrorist attack that blows up laplace and the last shot before we cut to the future is somebody reaching out towards the Universal Century Charter. Which, when you talk about how methodical this is, Sean, I love that they basically give you what Laplace's box is in the first two or three minutes of this show. Mm -hmm. And they and I did not figure out that's what it was going to be. But I love the circularity of like coming back to what it winds up being is right there in the first clip. Um but it's a great opening. Yeah, and like you said, it does it it sort of sets the flag for the kind of the treasure hunt aspect of the story immediately, but before you have the context, that's what you're going to have. So yes, yeah, so on first viewing, um I would say the vast majority of viewers are not going to put together that oh, that first scene that we watched was this treasure hunt thing that they introduced to us later, um that those are the yeah. same thing. So, yeah, but then it makes on second viewing, and we're like, oh, yeah, right, shit, okay, yeah, this is just here right now, and it creates a circular concept for um, the whole show, it has this circular feeling to it, because you kind of end where you start with seeing that charter um, and seeing the, like, hope of the new century that, that would unfold for humanity. At the beginning, that hope is destroyed. At the end, that hope has maybe been reclaimed, and which is the overall structure of what Unicorn Gundam um, does from kind of like a top level plot perspective and also establishing another i think major theme of this uh series which is that the universal century was basically founded in blood and violence mm -hmm. and it continued that way and it was not an aberration what happened with zeon and everything it was like this is what humanity in space was 
And I don't know, I like I think a lot about with Unicorn Gundam, when we get to like the final episode and the identity of Laplace's box, we can talk about all this, but there is, I think, a certain resonance to modern political systems and like discussions we have about like, you know, the American Constitution and some of the idealistic stuff in that versus what America has actually been and do we even want to fight to try to make it that ideal. I think there's a there's a lot of themes in this about that. And I think starting with that show of violence, yeah. Um, there's a lot going on here. But then, yeah, the, the majority of this episode is on Side 4's Industrial 7 colony, um, where Captain Zinnerman of Neo Zeon of the Sleeves Remnant, which is a great name, mm-hmm. and his ship, the Garencieres. How are we supposed to say that one, Sean? Oh, I don't remember. It's been like two weeks since I watched it, so I didn't even remember what his... Um, the Gur... Uh, Garincier, I think probably. Yeah. I don't like the. I think it's supposed to be vaguely Frenchy. Yeah, so, I actually yeah. wish I just had like the kana in front of me because they yeah. don't. That's not what they say in Japanese. It's, I'm on it's, the Gundam wiki, so I'm going through pages to try to get to where this ship is and see if I can see what the what it, how it's written in Japanese. So I'll I will fill us yes. in when I get there. But we have lots of time for that. But yes, he is going there to receive the key to Laplace's box from Cardias Vist, the patriarch of the Vist family. There's a girl named Audrey Byrne, who I also want to ask the question, how soon are you supposed to realize that's Minova? Um, who is trying to convince Vist not to hand over whatever this mysterious key is. Londo Bell arrives and attacks. Londo Bell being the group we met in Shar's Counterattack. They're headed by... Um, Bright, Captain Bright, uh, and there's a big fight in the colony. We meet Banerjee because he is at a school there, at an engineering school. He is trying to rescue Audrey. They kind of have this very, very like Miyazaki Castle in the Sky esque meeting mm-hmm. where she falls out of the sky and he helps her. And in the end, he's entrusted with the Unicorn Gundam and crazy fucking shit happens. So that's the top level, like what happens in this episode, Sean. So you are right. There's a ton to break down here, but. Yeah, let's break it. Go into just how well it, like you said, sets up all of its moving pieces. Yeah, because the main thing is it does is that it, it like does a very good job of focusing a lot around around Banaji's experiences of these events, and his character goes through a really like interesting um, and critical transformation over the course of the episode, where he is one of my favorite Gundam protagonists because he's. One of the few Gundam protagonists that I think recaptures a little bit of um, that kind of Amuro magic from the first episode of Mobile Suit Gundam. Of he he feels so kind of like meek and quiet and awkward in in a way that like in a way that feels like if new types really did exist um, and they were kids, like that is what they would be like. They would be this like he's this this very very sweet sensitive kid um, that is very kind of perceptive but part of his like perceptiveness feels like he kind of like closes himself off from the people around him and the body language they have for him is so strong of having um he has his hado that he's constantly kind of like cuddling like it's a stuffed animal or something that little touch um that he's doing that for almost the entire first episode um and whenever like he starts to kind of perceive something more negative happening he starts to kind of grab it um tighter that dynamic feels so smart from a t- storytelling perspective because it allows you to communicate a lot of information about who Banaji is at the beginning without giving us like a lot of backstory necessarily. Like you get the little glimpses of sort of what his family life must have been like um, as being, you know, he, he has basically no real family anymore um, by the time we meet him. And so that obviously has probably impacted a lot of like that kind of affectation that he now has with Hado. But it, but they communicate that entirely physically. And so his transformation of, of being that meek kid at the beginning to then at the end of this episode, getting into the Unicorn Gundam and just physically pushing the Kshatriya mobile suit out of the colony. Like that journey that he goes on in this one episode is so, so powerful and is communicated so much through performance and through visual language. And it doesn't lean on exposition to do it, which is one of the things I find very impressive. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things to talk about with, like, the pacing and structure of Unicorn Gundam is every one of the OVA episodes 
is really good about finding an arc for Banerjee in specific, and I think taking him to a new place than he was at the start of the hour, and I think that's pretty much how the show is structured. There is, we should mention, a TV version of Unicorn Gundam that is 22 episodes, uh, Gundam yeah. Unicorn Re-0096, and, and I've looked at that, and it's it seems like there's nothing missing. It's long enough that I think most of the stuff is in there. You're not necessarily missing pieces of story, but... Uh, just looking at like how it's broken down, if Banerjee is getting into the Unicorn Gundam at the end of the third episode of that, that feels very different than if you have a nice contained hour of action, you know? And I think you would obviously do yourself well to watch the original OVA version because those arcs are so finely sketched in these discrete hour-long episodes and then in the finale, 90 minutes. Yeah, it's, the OVAs are the way it was clearly like intended to be made. Like, it's, you know... If you want to watch the TV anime version, that's fine because it's got cool songs that were made for it specifically for like the OP and stuff. So that's those are good to watch. Same thing with the origin anime. Um, but yeah, I just feel the the OVAs have such a good sense of structure and pacing to them that I yeah I would recommend going with that original version over over the re edited versions. Yes. So. So that's Banerjee, and yes, there's a lot more to say about that there, but I do like that this episode also, with Audrey kind of as the other key figure, in the, I mean, there's kind of three we're introduced to here, there's Banerjee, Audrey, and then there is Rede is kind of in the background of this one, he comes into the four more in episode two, but I like that we also have this, this line with Audrey, who we learn is Minova, and that that is the person who Banerjee kind of Links, oh god, that's not what I meant to do. That's his last name, isn't it? He, he kind of yes. sticks himself to, and as you say, he's kind of an empath. He is very um, empathic to people, and that relationship is, it is so Miyazaki-esque, I don't know how else to describe it, but in this first episode, especially with them, like, running through this, this episode has such good, like, inner workings of the colony stuff as they're going around the whole colony, and up on, like, the scaffolding and things like that. It's so good. Um... How soon into the episode, Sean, when you first watched it, did you realize Audrey was Minova? Did was it oh, like I knew immediate, immediate or? Yeah, okay. I knew immediately. Yes. Um, yeah. Which, to be fair, I'm pretty sure at that point I had seen that character design. Um, okay. And it was had kind of, I, I think I kind of had already known that Minova was going to be in Unicorn Gundam. So I think I just like, I had enough pre-existing information that I like immediately put it together. Um, yeah, I don't know what. Yeah. How was it for you? I did not, um, because it is obviously a, she's like 10 years older than we've last yeah. seen her. We would have last seen her in Double Zeta when she's a little girl. So, and I had not seen this character design. I knew Minova, there was more of her out there somewhere. If for no other reason than Sean, when we talked about the Battle of Solomon and the little baby is taken away with her mother, who we know is Minova, you said something about how we'll see lots more of her. And by the time we got through Double Zeta, I'm like... I don't think I don't think what we've seen so far justifies what Sean said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I'm like there must be more Minova. Um, but it's like she's mysterious. She's got this cool name that sounds like a pseudonym. And then there is a line where I think it's Captain Zinnerman says something about how important she is. And I'm like, oh oh, they're oh cool. And my main reaction was like, Minova is going to be a main protagonist of a Gundam series. That is so fucking cool. And I continued to think that for the whole thing because I think what they do with Minova is one of the coolest things in this series. And I love that that character finally gets her due. Um, but yes, I I like that they do play it coy. L like, not that they're like hiding it from you. I don't think it's meant to be a shock when you find out she is Minova Zabi. Um, but it is, I, I do like how they play it out in this one. Yeah, because Minova has not changed her hairstyle since she was like five years old. So, yeah. so she's... She's not trying to hide it super hard. <laughs> she, no. She, while she does look older, she's... I feel like most people look more different <laughs> in the, yeah. from, when they're like 6 to where they're 16. Um, but yeah, it is it is one of like those things about Unicorn Gundam that you can very easily imagine um, a version of this where that just doesn't work at all, where it's too kind of fanish. Um, the idea of we're going to bring in Mineva and make her one of the main characters. So it's something that I can kind of like with doing a shark clone, like a literal shark clone. You can imagine it be going poorly. But it is so nice having that thread wrapped up because that is by far like the most significant thing that goes unresolved in the original um, Gundam saga is Mineva just kind of disappears as a character i mean quite literally because in double zeta one of the last things you find out is that at least for double zeta 
every appearance of Mineva has actually been a body double the whole time, and that the actual Mineva Zabi is somewhere else in space, um, and that Haman Karn has kind of secreted her away at some point. Um, and so, like, that character just kind of, like, completely disappears, and because Tomino exits that section of Universal Century 2, by the time F-91 takes place, Mineva would be, like, a grandmother or dead um, there's no space to do anything with that character. And so it's one of my favorite things about Unicorn Gundam as a fan of Gundam is that they do the Mineva stuff and they do it really well so that that weird character thread gets wrapped up in a way that feels satisfying. That you don't have this character that's like, I, you know, like for the, like the secret daughter of Hitler or something is out there somewhere in the world to like has the potential keys to like the Nazi, the space Nazi empire that character is important enough that we should know something more about her. And I'm very, very glad that Unicorn Gundam does not fuck that up. Absolutely. It does not fuck that up at all. So yes, this other things just with this first episode is I think, cause there's so many pieces it puts on the board that we need to talk about. Like mm -hmm. obviously there's the entire weird mythological element of introducing this Laplace's box thing but then also very clearly, this show signals, and I think it is one of the things that Unicorn Gundam r really distinguishes it from other Gundam series, is how much it is about both sides of the conflict, and it is not a show where the hero is aligned with either one. This is not a show where the hero joins the Federation and is fighting Zeon. That's like just not the focus of this one at all. Because um, he, he spends pretty much equal time on Federation and Zeon ships. And at a certain point, like the... Garen Sierras is not either of them, you know, it is kind of an independent vessel by the end of the show, and so meeting Captain Zinnerman and meeting uh, Marita Cruz in this one, who is kind of the first enemy he goes up against but will become a friend, there's just so many pieces and so many vivid characters you meet in this one, and it's also a Tomino-esque brutal opening in that Banerjee and his friends see most of their classmates murdered brutally in front of them, um, and largely because Londo Bell are the aggressors in this one, which I also think is a very clear, like, planting a flag moment of, like, the neo Zeon people are not the ones doing the crazy violence in this episode, mostly. It's, it's, it's Londo Bell gets, like, in over their skis. So, yes, lots and lots to, to pick apart here. Yes, because um, you then also you have, like, thinking about Banaji's uh, classmates, you do have, like, the token best friend and childhood friend um, female love interest character of you have Takia and Mikot, um, that I think they're, like, they're, they're one of those things that feels like, a, oh, if this was actually, like, the 50-episode Gundam TV show, these characters would, you know, they would be around more and have more stuff. Like, they're fine in, in, in the OVA series, but they're those that, like, they fit into these Gundam archetypes that if a lot of other Gundam shows didn't exist, I think their characters would be weirder, bigger question marks. But you kind of fill in the blanks because it's like, oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are the Fraubo, Mikot. You're the Fa Yuri. You are the, this character in the show. Like, I know you. I have seen you. I, we, yes. we're, we're good. You don't, we don't need to dive into these guys. Yeah, they mostly disappear by the final episode because it the, the show really focuses itself on the main three of Bonaji, Audrey, and Rite, and then on the side you have like Full Frontal and Captain Zinnerman and Marita, and those kind of fill out the side. But yes, Mikot and the other one do not show up a ton past the first couple episodes. Yeah, but they get to, you know, they have that like one token moment and I think it's in episode seven where they like hold hands or whatever and goes, yes. Banaji! Um it's like, okay, yes, of course, they hooked up. Yes, the Hayato and the Frabo hooked up. We're good. We've checked off the gun to box. Thank you, Gundam. No. I'm glad they're there. I mean, there is, because yeah. they are the ones that Rede rescues in this one, and that is how he gets, like, in with, with everybody. I mean, he's... Because mm -hmm. I forget, is he, is he on the Londo Bell crew in this one, or is he just at Industrial 7? He's on the Londo Bell crew. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he rescues them, and then you do have Mikot is very torn up about the mass <laughs> extinction of her classmates she watched. Um, so that kind of helps you bring that home. But I guess, Sean, the other thing to talk about here is let's just talk about the concept of Laplace's box. I mean, we will get to okay. what it is, but for the, mo for the first six hours of Unicorn Gundam, you do not know what is in the box. And so... Gundam certainly does not do anything like this in anything I've seen so far. According to you, it really never does this. No, yeah, this is not... Like, there's there's a couple of plot devices that are vaguely like this, but there's nothing that's like, the whole show is this. There's like, oh, here's the two-episode arc that deals with this, like, weird mysterious object or whatever that's like a kind of a scavenger hunt thing. Gundam yeah. has done that. 
Gundam has never done Laplace's box ever. Yeah. Which I this, think, obviously. again, as you said earlier on, this could be a fatal flaw if done poorly because this kind of stuff is done poorly all the time in modern narrative fiction. But it is, I think, a pretty fascinating MacGuffin that gives it, like I said, this very Arthurian kind of quest to it. I think you could also go with like the Treasure Island comparison. But it is this hidden thing that is imbued with great power. Everyone is afraid of it. Everyone wants it. And the goal is to find it. And they literally are going on some kind of scavenger hunt that they are sent through the Laplace program to, which I love that it is the Law Plus program for the Law Place box. Phenomenal. Um, yep. This show, this show has the spirit of Tomino doing the names in it, even if he didn't work on it. Because these are yeah. such like Tomino names. Which, because, by the way, like, those would be, they're the exact same in Japanese. So it's the, yes. it's like, at some point, I don't even know if it counts as a pun, because they're it's, spelled the same in Japanese. It's so good. But anyway, that you're going through all that, and I think it provides such a good spine for the show. I also think it's something that, this being an OVA series, I think if it were a 50-episode, year-long run, the Laplace box thing would not work. But I think it mm-hmm. being seven movies, basically, it's a really good thing to carry you through. Because like with most good mystery boxes, if a mystery box is done well, it's not really about the mystery box. It's about the journey along the way. And what the mystery box is sending them through is basically the history of universal century violence. And it basically provides a spine for our main character, Bonaji, to go through the history of Gundam and reckon with the sins and failures of the world he was born into. And that's what everyone is thinking about. And while Unicorn Gundam has some of the most spectacular action in the whole series, it's a much more philosophically dense series than the other Gundam UC shows. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what it's about. And then I think the ultimate revelation with Laplace's box is very fulfilling and like is exactly what it needs to be. But I think they pitch it just right throughout these seven episodes to be this air of like high adventure mystery which really propels the show along but also provide a really clear spine for all of the philosophical discussions and kind of thematic breakdowns the show is so interested in throughout yeah and i think one thing that helps make it work is that there are long stretches where it's not like an active entity in the show right Mm -hmm. they usually it's kind of for the whole middle kind of section from episodes like three four um, in five, in kind of a little bit of six, like they are, the Laplace's box is how you get to this spot. So it's like, okay, we have to go here. But then once you get there, it there's like the Laplace's box thing is no longer a factor. It's like, okay, we've gotten to this location and oh shit, now like the sleeves remnants here are going nuts. We'd have to do something about it. Like, okay, we got here. Oh, no shit, full frontal showed up. And so it's like the plots of individual episodes are not really about the treasure hunt. They're about... Like the treasure hunt pushes puts you in this specific place. Now, now like the story of this episode is going to happen at that place, but it's not really about the box. And that's one of the things I think makes it work is that like the box can be a, like a little motivator to move the characters around, um, to kind of put them into the place to have conflicts. But the box itself is not the source of every single conflict in the show, which is often what like the poorly done version would be, where it just is like oh, everything is driven by this weird, mysterious object we have no real context for and where we only care about it because we're told to care about it. That's the kind of thing that doesn't work for me when it is just like, a, okay, here's a little nudge we have. But you can kind of easily imagine a lot of these stories happening without that nudge even needing to exist. And like there would just be some other minor justification for why this character has gone to this location and the, the plot would happen the same way. And that's one of the things I think that helps make it work really well. Absolutely. So, Unicorn Gundam Episode 1 has one of the most rip-shit, amazing fucking endings Mm -hmm. of any episode of television. In that, like, Industrial 7 is burning, everything has gone to shit, Banaji is, like, lost in the bowels of this colony and finds the Unicorn Gundam, and Cardias Vist, who is this... He's only in one episode, but that character sure makes an impact, because he lingers, obviously, through the whole series... Um, finds Banerjee, puts him in the Unicorn Gundam. Like, Banerjee intuits, basically, through new type stuff that this man is his actual father. And Cardias Fist, like, literally, like, like anoints him with his blood, which is such an amazing mm-hmm. image. And, and entrusts the Unicorn Gundam as, like, this hope for the future of humanity to him. You realize 
Oh no, it is an actual giant white mobile suit with a suit with a big fucking horn. That's amazing. That's what I wanted. And then he goes out to fight Marita Cruz, who also has an amazing mobile suit. And it's like, oh no, it's not just a mobile suit with a big horn. It expands out with this crazy red energy and gets two horns. And the episode ends with basically the unicorn transforming, doing a pose, and running into battle, cut to credits and theme song. Sean, I stood up and applauded. I was like so... The, I just, and I just, I think my, tw I tweeted about this because it's true. I just said the word like, fuck, at the end of that episode because it is such a, a hammer drop of an ending. It sounds like you probably think the same way given what you were saying about this episode. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, every Unicorn Gundam episode has just amazing fucking endings. Like it is, even for how long each episode is, because most episodes are like basically a full hour, it is very hard to just watch one episode of Unicorn Gundam. It's like you have to, it's so like, ah, oh, shit, I need to have, watch what happens next. Which makes imagining watching this thing across the four years in which it originally aired from 2010, uh, March 2010 to May 2014, like that would have been fucking brutal to have to wait for like six months at a time between episodes just for some of those ridiculous. Um, I think the sixth and seventh episodes, there's there was a full year. Yes. And knowing how episode six ends, good God, that would have been hard. Yeah, because none of these episodes other than the last one end on like full endings they always like have this little like baton pass to like oh shit the f like we yeah we solved the problem down here on earth and oh fuck now there's another black there's a black unicorn gundam is here what the fuck end of the episode okay shit well now i have to watch the next episode because what the fuck is the black unicorn gundam um and so yeah episode one uh yeah like that whole thing of of one i just love the idea of um, the Unicorn Gundam's one horn splitting into the Gundam V, the yes. Golden Gundam V, and that's what makes it, like, because that's when um, Marita sees it, and she's like, Gundam. Um, he's like, yes, now it's a fucking, now it, it, it goes from a unicorn into a proper Gundam. Um, but then, even more than that, the stuff a little bit before it, where Banaji gets into the Unicorn Gundam, like, his whole world has been destroyed around him, um, because also his, like, emotional relationship with Audrey has, like, goes, is very up and down. Of, like, he's like, oh, I'm really attached to you. And then she's like, get the fuck out of my face, you weird boy. Because she does, she airbuds him. Like, get out of here, boy. Get out. Because she loves him so much. You have to go. Um, is that an airbud thing? That's an, that's an airbud thing. That's okay. that's what they do to airbud. I mean, that's it's, it's, it was something from earlier than that, I'm sure. I think of airbud, the ending of airbud. Um, okay. When I think of that, it makes me cry. Anyways... But yeah, so he gets into the Unicorn Gundam and he's like, his whole world has fallen apart and then he sees the Kishitreya there um, just destroying everything and he just slams into it and just screams basically like, get the fuck out of here and just physically pushes a like a much, much larger mobile suit. The Kishitreya is gigantic and the Unicorn Gundam just fucking tackles it all the way through like out the whole length of the cylinder of the space colony and shoots it and like ejects it out into space. And Marita is in you like you have those cut ins to Marita in the cockpit and the fucking airbags popping off and her like shaking around unable to like control her mobile suit because the Unicorn Gundam, while it is much smaller, they communicate so much of the power that the mobile suit has in that moment. And there's just a really gratifying sense of sort of power in that moment for Banaji um where you know he has been so restrained for the whole story and then he's like he gets into the mobile suit and you know he's not like trying to kill anybody the thing he thinks to do is just basically to shove the other mobile suit really hard just like get the fuck out of here man and just push her out um I think that like that is such a such a great moment of Banaji becoming the Gundam protagonist right like he goes from being like the boy um, that seems that there's something off about him to now he's the Gundam protagonist who's the pilot of this mobile suit and must sort of navigate all the themes and sort of pitfalls that all our Gundam protagonists, all our Gundam boys must go through. Which the show, we should say, is very aware of. Like, this is... Like, yeah. Zeta and Double Zeta also do some of this in terms of, I think, very consciously tweaking elements of the original show. But Unicorn has this different, like, 30-year-out perspective of what were the major signposts of Tomino-era Gundam, and, like, how can we tweak and use those, and, like, 
you know, Banerjee is a per like literally. There's going to be when Captain Bright enters the scene, um, and and his big episode is episode. Well, he's in most of the show, but in episode five, he's got a lot of stuff. He's very conscious of this and basically gives Banerjee a speech about being a Gundam boy. <laughs> he doesn't go like that. He doesn't say, "You are now the Gundam boy." <laughs> Gundam no shonen. I have, yeah, I have known many Gundam boys, and trust me, you are one of them. Yes, that would be great if Bright said that. He doesn't, but but that is very conscious in terms of those elements. And we're all also already seeing in this one how they're playing with that with Marita Cruz. Um, but yes, it is such a great ending. And I think for me, Sean, I just had no idea what to expect of Unicorn Gundam because mm -hmm. I just realized, like, because I had done research on other Gundam shows before I'd watched them, and I I knew like Double Zeta has a dude named Judo, and he's gonna fight. You know, the Neo Zeon Empire, and Judo is kind of a junker, and it's a little more of a silly series at the beginning. But with Unicorn, for like, I just had never read anything about it. I did not know. I didn't even, I think you had told me the main Gundam has a big, cool horn. That's about all I knew, was that this, this series had a silly fucking name, and a Gundam with a big, cool horn. And by the end of episode one, just with... Laplace's box and what an immediately winning character Bonaji is who like I think Bonaji goes right up there with Judo and Camille and Amuro he slots in next to the other Gundam boys effortlessly which is great that is amazing that they were able to do that four times in this original continuity May I haven't seen Victory Gundam yet maybe five um, and it's and it just all it works out so perfectly and you get to the end of that first episode and I was just so fucking hooked and I basically haven't stopped thinking about Unicorn Gundam since it's very good. It's it's a fucking amazing episode. Like I de I definitely remember very clearly the first time I watched it and got yeah. to that ending and being like, holy shit. Because that's the other thing about it that we haven't really addressed is just like the production of Unicorn Gundam. It's so gorgeous looking. Like this whole show, it's so well animated. It's so well directed. It just looks fantastic. So it's got, I think, basically the best mobile suit fights probably of any Gundam show. Like you know, there's some stuff in F ninety one. Um, there's stuff in Shard's Counterattack that is very, very, very good. But Unicorn Gundam, if you're just if you're going for like the spectacle above all else, especially Unicorn Gundam has some crazy shit that happens in it that is very, very well animated. So just from a like spectacle point of view, it is always really, really enthralling to watch. Oh, absolutely! This show is stylistically just out of this world. I mean, because let's be clear, it's not just the animation. And the choreography, it is also the music. Mm -hmm. And that is clear from episode one onwards. It's Hiroyuki Sawana, right? What's his name? Uh, yeah, Hiroyuki Sawano. Sawano, okay. And the score for this show, because the main Unicorn Gundam theme you hear in that closing scene of the first episode is so amazing. It is this, it's basically the closest any Gundam show has, I would say, to like a big, like, almost John Williams score for Gundam. Mm -hmm. Like it is a big orchestral sweeping movie score for this seven episode thing. And it is just constantly astounding. I think it's the best music in any Gundam thing. I don't know if there, there was, there are others you would point to Sean, but it's definitely the, the one that has hit me hardest and it is just used so well throughout. I think when you just look at like the production of Unicorn Gundam, that it is seven movies made over five full calendar years, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, released one at a time, big pro I mean, I even like Gundam The Origin as an OVA is really cool and clearly kind of follows in Unicorn's footsteps production wise, but it does not blow me away as much as Unicorn does as like a thing that was made. I can't believe Sunrise did this at a certain point. It is such a huge undertaking to watch unfold. Yeah, because. Yes, because the music is fantastic. Hideyuki Sawano is one of my favorite anime composers. Like everything he's on, I, I just think is fantastic. Because he's definitely in that kind of um, John Williams esque style of he definitely likes to sort of latch into a couple of like very like strong key themes and motifs and reuse those and kind of play with them throughout the show. Um, and yeah, so that the end of episode one is when you first get that kind of like full bodied Unicorn Gundam theme which is the main theme that goes across the whole show and is used in a bunch of different contexts. But the really triumphant music um, at the end of episode one is so good. It's just like any time the fucking Unicorn Gundam transforms and that music kicks in, it is, it's a good time. It's a good, you're just, you're just having fun. You're always having fun um, when that theme plays. It's so good. All right. 
Uh, I don't know if we're going to go through every episode in as much depth, just because episode one kind of, there's so much to establish. But episode two is called The Red Comet. In English, they called it The Second Coming of Shar. I like the title just Akai Suisei because it is so, because it also leaves some of that ambiguity of like, there's a red comet, who the hell is it? Um, because this episode is mostly about full frontal. It is the Gundam beats Morita, it beats the Kashitreya, um, and then the Nahal Argama comes, it picks up Banaji, it picks up the UC Gundam. We meet the character Daguza Mackle, which is an amazing name. He is an Echoist officer. Echoist is like a new group in the Federation in this series. And Daguza will become very important in episode three. I really love that character. He is mm -hmm. the, basically every episode is Banaji with a different father figure. We'll talk about that thematically. But then you have the surprise attack where Zeon and Full Frontal come. And most of the episode is a standoff where they where full frontal has like the Nal Argama has no strength against them. They are way outnumbered. Full frontal demands the Argama hand over the Gundam, hand over anything about Laplace's box. And so Audrey, and this is really Audrey kind of owns this episode alongside Full Frontal, because she reveals she is Maneva. She's like, you can use me as a hostage in negotiation, and Full Frontal refuses to negotiate on that point. Banaji goes out to fight against the Sinanju, which is Full Frontal's mobile suit. Um, he gets captured, and then the last couple, like the last 20 minutes, are all on the asteroid base of Palau, as Banaji kind of gets to know Marita, has conversations with Full Frontal, and there's a plan to buy uh, Echoist and Daguza to go rescue Banaji. But I think that second episode is such a nice, it's it's a very clear change of pace. It's like a high tension episode in like a hostage negotiation situation. It's a lot of getting to know this crazy Char clone dude that is out there and seeing the different factions at play. Um, but there's a lot of beautiful stuff in this one too. Yeah, and, and this is definitely like, this is the full frontal episode to me like this is the one where like he comes in this is where like because we were just talking about the animation the animation is always great i feel like they especially kind of pull out all the stops whenever full frontal is doing something cool yep. um because they just really nail that sense of like what makes char terrifying in the original mobile suit gundam especially um as like that just the, the raw sense of speed and confidence he had as a mobile suit pilot before new types came in and fucked everything up um which is something that like you know i i have somewhat mixed feelings about that aspect of making char um that like imposing an individual mobile suit pilot because there was something i really liked about that original arc for the character about like he's the hottest shit around for most of mobile suit gundam by the end of mobile suit gundam he can't hold a candle to amuro and he never again can like even in char's counterattack, amuro like once that fight goes all the way in amuro pretty handily deals with char and he's never like able really to kind of hold it up to amuro in a fight and there's something about that i like um but especially in this episode where you don't know exactly yet what his what full frontal's relationship is to char whether char survived whether he's a clone whether he's just some weird char fanboy who's who's very good at doing an impression or like whatever his d weird deal is um they do do a very good job of sort of this like getting that feel of this is this is a man who like you just cannot stand against he's he's the guy that in episode two of mobile suit gundam they say there's a Zaku coming at us three times the normal speed, and then the captain um, who dies, you know, later just says, "That's Char. It's Char, the man who sunk seven battleships at the Battle of Loom. Like we have to run away." It gets that feeling of the character back um, because, yeah, I think, and this was my reading of Full Frontal right from the beginning. He is not Char. Yeah, he was designed to be your ideal like id version of char he was designed to be the red comet of loom the propaganda tool of the zeon government like again like i did not know exactly where they were going with it is he char reincarnated is it a clone it's kind of all of the above in the end but like he is essentially as we learn in episode seven and a uh, uh, narrative gundam actually follows up on this and it fills in some of the holes for us but he is basically a cyber new type who was engineered to get as close to Char as they could. And then there's this whole thing with like the psycho frame from the Axis shock, which is what they're calling it in Unicorn Gundam, which I like that it's got kind of a name, what happened in Char's counterattack. Um, and, but in any case, what you see, I think in episode two and then in his other appearances is this isn't exactly Char as we remember him. I think it's Char as we kind of 
want to remember him. And there's a whole meta commentary going on with here, especially I think when you get into all of Full Frontal's monologues about how he is an empty vessel that takes on the desires of his people, basically. And I think there is this whole sort of thing about like, Char went on such this interesting evolutionary journey and you and I, for instance, Sean, have praised that so much. But as much as you can say, yeah, Char was kind of a kid who never grew up and he was a very broken man and all of the, and he never really succeeded in his goals. We also have this pull towards we want him to be the Red Comet. We love that crazy dude in the cool mask in the awesome big red mobile suit going three times as fast as normal. And we want him to be the baddest dude around. And there's just that kind of like animal instinct there. And I think Full Frontal diegetically in this show is built to like give that to the people of Zeon so they can like have this 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 propaganda figure and I think it is also a sort of meta thing about like what we want out of Gundam and I think all of that works together really interestingly to me yeah because because he also exists in a like long line of like not literal shark clones but what the fan community calls shark clones which are which is the shark archetype as he exists in other Gundam shows that don't exist in the Universal Century timeline. So you have like the the biggest one is the dude from Gundam Wing who just looks like Char. He is so and his and his role in the narrative is very Char esque. Um, he's the guy who pilots the tall geese. So I have a little tiny version of him in my model tall geese right now that's sitting over there. Um, and he's never but, getting yeah. out, as you told us last time. <laughs> yes, he's there's. I would have to disassemble that thing. Took me like probably about ten hours all to, told to put that fucking thing together. He is definitely never coming out. Zex is just in there forever, um, and, and I'm the only one who really knows it. Um, but yeah, so we you have him. You have um, I mean, just again, almost every single Gundam show has some Char esque equivalent. Whether the show like sort of brings that in. Um, sort of more diegetically or does or like more kind of self-consciously like after war Gundam X has a Char equivalent that they're like very kind of self-conscious that like they're examining that this is this like Char archetype because that shows um, that does a lot of interesting things with that um, or there are some where it's like eh, he's not that Char-esque but you have to put a mask on somebody because it's Gundam and that's how big of a shadow this character casts um, and so full frontal definitely exists as like a commentary both within this show on the Xeon relationship with Char himself um but then also within the Gundam franchise's fascination with the character um and the thing that like again I think the thing that makes Full Frontal work for me because it's a character as a concept that I think could so easily I I could like just get like kind of repulsed by it because there there is something very like fanish about oh let's take the our fan favorite character who died very clearly at the end of Shars counterattack and then let's just we want to use him again after the that story so let's just make a clone of him um that could very easily f get fucked up but the writing is really sharp on him and then Shuji Keda does such a phenomenal job in the performance of capturing the things Jonathan you were just talking about of this guy is not Shar like and it is it's so much of the performance feels like Shuji Keda doing an impersonation of Char. Like it's him. He's just putting a little bit extra on it. Um, and there's that's like especially if you compare his performance in this with his performance in the Origin, which is a similar age to Ikeda, so it's like the deeper, growlier, like gravelier um voice to Shuji Keda. But in Origin, he gets like much more of like this feels like Char. Like this feels like that character saying these things. Full Frontal feels like a guy trying to play Char and trying, like, he sits in the room, he puts on the mask, and, and he says the Char things, like, the, giving the Char kind of speeches from Char's counterattack. Um, but he never has, like, the discomfort that Char had as a human being, you know? There's, there's never that sense of, like, who Char actually was underneath it all, which you definitely... By the time you get to Zeta Gundam, get that kind of access to Char as a character as you feel the different layers that he's projecting. Full Frontal feels like a man who is empty, just projecting out the id of Char. And that is such a like key thing that Ikeda captures in the performance. That I think like that is what lands the character for me, is that it doesn't just feel like they're trying to do Char again. It feels like they are very actively playing with the idea of Char as a character. Yes, and that's what's so key, because I totally agree, if you just told me on paper, go watch Unicorn Gundam, they literally cloned Char, I would be like, that's dumb, but 
that the key is that it's not like it's it's specifically challenging like your there are a couple of moments where you get the shard dopamine rush of like him rushing around in a red mobile suit my favorite one in the whole unicorn gundam is at the beginning of episode six when he has come to rescue the garanciaries and the nalargama and he he beats all the mobile suits and then he comes up to the bridge of the nalargama and says all right now that we're alone, can we talk? And it's such a great Ikeda line reading. And that's like, that is a Char moment that is just perfect. But for the most part, it's not trying to, I think, scratch that Char itch. It's trying to challenge it for you. And I think it's exactly what you said about Ikeda's performance, is that he's not Char. He's a dude trying to be Char. And he's trying to be it very hard. And he has a lot of those qualities. He is very confident, and he is quick on his feet, and he is smart. And all of that is projected through this episode. But they're they're constantly putting you in scenarios where you're where like you know how Shar would act roughly in this situation, and you're kind of trying to figure out who this guy is and kind of like question and, and seek it out. And so you have the long hostage standoff here in episode two. Later in episode two, you have on the asteroid base at Palau, you have Banaji have this long conversation with him in his office, and Shar like takes off the mask and all that, which also there is the sound effect of Full Frontal's mask, which is a really heavy giant metal thing, which is also different than what Shar had, which I love. Um is so interesting and and he, this is where you first get him talking about how he is the vessel is when you start to realize this isn't Char and like I just think it is such a fascinating idea to get Shuichi Ikeda back do that character design but kind of specifically do an anti-Char out of it in a lot of interesting ways um it's proof of what a rich character that is but I think also more proof of how much Gundam has always been in conversation with that character and with that archetype. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's, he's really about here. Um, so I, I don't think they could have done a better job with it, especially when we get to episode seven. Like, I am so glad they did the literal shark clone. And I didn't think I would say that. It's amazing. Yeah, because they really, because they even go so far as to, um, like, Full Frontal's first line in Unicorn Gundam, where he's flying in to, and he, like, sees the Gundam, the Unicorn Gundam transformed and he, he has his line, which is a, like, echo of one of his most famous lines from episode two, which is, is Misete Moraoka. Like, is, like, let me, show me, like, the, the performance of this so-called Federation mobile suit um, when he's, before, you know, they know what a Gundam is or anything. Um, it's a line that the fan base quotes all the time, um, the Japanese fan base in particular. And, and he does the same thing. Like, it is his first line in Unicorn Gundam is him doing a version of one of Char's most famous quotes from the fan base, which, is, which, again, would be something that in a different context, in a different show that wasn't doing it critically, I would be like, oh, fuck off. Like, that's so self-indulgent. It would make me feel the way that I feel about some stuff in, like, episode seven in the Star Wars sequel trilogy of, like, you're so attached to the, the your own past in this very, like, cloying way, and it's very annoying. Um, here, it's like they quote that line, but to set up this idea of, oh, this is, like, that Char. This is the badass Char from the original Mobile Suit Gundam. But then they go on to, as we've been talking about, criticize that idea. And so, yeah, that, like, the the way they're playing with, like, fan expectations around that character is very, very smooth. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we'll have lots more to say when... When he, see, when he sees the tears of time alongside... Yes. I don't know how else to describe that sequence later on, other than it just makes me think of the Zeta Gundam line, and I have to say it. So, yeah. there you go. But yes, episode two, great stuff. I also think episode two is where... Um, I, I don't know when we should have our big conversation about uh, Enzin Ride, because he is there in all seven episodes... He really like comes into focus later on. Episode two is where he starts to have a relationship with Mineva, and so he becomes like clearly the other track protagonist in this thing, who's going to go in the opposite direction, like Mineva in the center, and then Banaji and Riddy on the sides. But I think the character who also steals the show in episode two is Marita Cruz, where we start to see her on Palau. We also see a little bit of Captain Zinnerman, who's one of my favorite characters in this. But you start to see Marita as a person. Um, and there is a scene that is just etched in my memory of them in a chapel on the asteroid mm -hmm. with like the stained glass window color and her and Banerjee having one of the big philosophical unicorn Gundam talks that is just utterly gorgeous. And I think through these seven episodes, Marita very clearly establishes herself as one of the best characters on this show. So, 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I think because that's also where they do the Pudu 12 reveal, right? Yeah. That they say, which is another like smart thing they do of, um, I think, helping kind of set up the idea of that Full Frontal is a Char clone. They they take the one other time that Gundam has done cloning and they kind of bring that back up. So you have your Pudu 12, you get a like... You get the outline of Glimmy Toto, which, if you are a human being, should make your fucking skin crawl. Anytime you see that sleazy motherfucker, um, it's like, God, I fucking hate Glimmy. He sucks. Um, but yeah, so like that, um, again, another thing that like often you would think that's like could be done in this very cloying way, like this very backwards looking way of let's bring, let's take one of the Pudu clones that could have survived and let's bring that character in. But they do so much with Marita to make her her own character that, like, the fact that she's a Pudu clone is, like, a fun little addition. But, like, the she's basically a, a cyber new type, and it doesn't have to be anything more... Like, they don't go super deep into it, which I think is smart. Like, they don't have to sort of... She doesn't have some weird, like, sort of, like, clone memory of Judo or something. She's not constantly having flashbacks to Glimmy Toto. They just give you, like, little hints of it, and, and that's all you kind of need to kind of get that sense of the character. Yeah, I think it's a really nice connection if you have watched Double Zeta and have that knowledge. And I think it fills in a lot of, like, the emotional... Like, it's an emotional shorthand because just knowing she is Pudu 12, your relationship with Pudu's 1 and 2 tells you so much about her, you know? Mm -hmm. And, like, it gives you kind of a backstory that you that the show does not need to dwell on. Um, but, yeah, she gets to, she, they do not have her running around going, Pudu, 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 which would be weird as an adult woman to do that. But, no, you know, no. I don't know. I feel like Pudu 1 never would have lost that side of herself. So, <laughs> Pudu 2 has had a dark life. Or, Pudu 12. Um, Pudu yeah. 2 also had a dark All all the non-1 Pudus had very, very fucked up lives Yes a Pudu 1 did too Just Yeah, but she, she, she got her big bro judo You know, yes. she got she got that in her life So, you know, it, it worked yes, out she had the least yeah, Well, it didn't work out in the end But it worked out in girl. the middle there uh, Yeah Yeah So anyway um, Alright, so we have all of that with Marita Just, you know, very solid episode Episode 3, The Ghost of Laplace is a really interesting one to me. Um, it's the one where mostly it's about the relationship between Banaji and Daguza, um, who is the echoist dude who winds up being an interesting kind of mentor father figure. Um, this episode starts with the big rescue from Palau. You have some big, cool mobile suit action. All of that's good. This is also the one where Ride and Minova go together. Um, they escape from the Argama and go to Earth because Minova wants to talk to Ronin Marcinus because we learn Ride is Ride Marcinus, who is another big family, kind of like the Vist family. Um, and then the second half of this episode, they go to Laplace, the actual remains of that space colony we saw blow up in the first episode. And they hear the broadcast of the Earth Federation Establishment Ceremony. The sleeves come. There's a big fight. Dakuza sacrifices himself for Banaji. You have some really cool uh, new type shit. And then one of the more memorable episodes or endings of all the Unicorn Gundam endings where you have the re-entry to Earth as the theme song of this one, Merry Go Round by the band Chemistry, who's, they're a good band. They also did one for Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood around the same time. Um, and you have this big re-entry to Earth. There's a lot of good stuff in this one. And I, I like Daguza, and then I like how this sets up, like, because the next episode is going to be all Banaji and Captain Zinnerman. And I think these different kind of father figures and Banaji trying to reckon with the past and being in this soldier position. There's a lot of really interesting stuff there that feels like, again, it is a recontextualization of past Gundam boy persona, or you know, like archetypes and stuff, but in a really thoughtful, critical way that seems like it's pushing things forward. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, because as you say, this episode is him with his like Federation father figure esque character. Um, that yeah, they they do a good job with Daguza getting that sense of like Daguza cares about Banaji, but you also like he's just enough of a like hard Earth Federation like toe the line kind of dude that like. I do don't want Banaji to spend too much time with him. Like you did, like I feel like Banaji would end up like Amuro if he spent too much time with yes. Banaji. He would, he'd end up like eventually like shackled to some weird mansion on Earth, you know, because he's too in with the Federation. Um, and yeah, but but that like brief relationship he has with Daguza is executed very well. And then and then there's always a 
soft spot in my heart for any time Gundam does the re-entry episode. It's always one of the best episodes. It's always one of the best things you can do is have the Gundam fall to Earth and have a big, cool, th- like, shot of from from the ground on Earth with a character looking up and seeing the Gundam fucking coming in from, like, 500 miles away, and it's like a fucking falling star. I mean, Gundam has done that shot probably about 15 times to this point by the time you record Gundam happens, but it's good every single time they do it. Oh, it's always so good, and... I think doing it with the credits in this one is such a great mic drop of an ending. Yeah. Yeah, I love all of that. Episode 4, At the Bottom of the Gravity Well. One great title. Dark as sin fucking episode, because this is where you have um, Banerjee with the Garancieres for the most of the episode. He is with Captain Zinnerman. They go through the desert together. I want to talk about some of those scenes. Um, but you also have the big attack on Dakar happens to let the Garcenaries in. And then at the end, you have the attack on the Torrington base and this character named Lonnie, who uh, Bonaji is trying to save. And there is just death everywhere. It's one of the like big Gundam massacre episodes. Like nothing good ever happens when characters go to Earth in Gundam. Every time mm-hmm. everyone goes to Earth is when the darkest stretch of the show happens. Like every single fucking time. And so it's just insane you also get uh captain bright comes back in this episode and he's there pretty much for the rest of the series which is cool we'll talk about that um and then you also have marida being transported to uh this like facility where the where martha vist carbine and the other carbine dude are like doing horrible horrible new type experiments on her so very dark episode that ends with uh, Bonaji and Ride having this big argument where Bonaji does not want to kill Lonnie, the woman in this like mobile armor that is going crazy, and Ride kills her himself, and then it like ends with a gun at the Unicorn Gundam's head, which is awesome, and then the black unicorn dropping into the field. So I love this one. Yeah, this is this is I think the first episode, this episode, and the last episode are my three favorites. Um yeah, this one because, I mean, the main thing that I love so much about this one is Zinnerman, who yes. is one of the best characters from this show. Subaroa Z- Zinnerman. Let's give his full name because Subaroa Zinnerman is also a very, very good Gundam name. Um, and yeah, like him being the like grizzled old pilot on the Xeon side um, who, who's like the, the, you know, gruff father figure with a heart of gold. Like it, it is a little bit of a cliche character, but they pull it off so well in those scenes in the desert when when they're together and him giving the kind of like tough love um thing to Banaji and trying to kind of show Banaji how to kind of pull himself back up from the depression that he's in um some of the best stuff in this whole show some of the best stuff Zinnerman to me feels like if Ramba Rao lived mm-hmm. and was still Ramba Rao like 20 years later well this so this is 96 so this is like 17 years after the one year war and like a Ramba Rao who maybe he and Haman actually tied the knot and then had some kids and then they all died because the Federation did something really shitty and because that's Zinnerman's backstory he lost his family he kind of has nothing other than his crew and the war you get the sense that he is not ideological with Zeon. Like, he is not someone who, like, is fighting because he thinks he has to take over the Earth. It's because this is kind of his role and his place. And it is the spot where Bonaji realizes he has so much more in common with these people than he has in difference. And kind of sees that gap that I think all the Gundam protagonists see at one point or another. But it becomes really raw to Bonaji because... This isn't quite a war that's going on. He is not tied to any one single side. Um, And then it's all challenged, I think, in a really interesting way in the closing sequence where the Zeons are doing something just appalling to this Torrington base. They are killing all these. Because it's the, we should say, the way Zeon is constructed in the Unicorn Gundam series is that there is the Sleeves Force led by Full Frontal in space, but then it's all these different guerrilla forces on Earth. And so... Basically, they're like the Lonnie character, who is this key to the end of the episode, is from one of these Earth forces. And they are like much more ruthless. They're kind of all gone crazy. Um, Zinnerman is sort of supporting them, but you can tell he doesn't believe in it. But he is like so calcified inside. He's not standing up and trying to put a stop to the violence. And so he and Bounaji get into this whole fist fight that I think is really like hard to watch in a good way. And. And it gets into sort of the the rationalization of war and the hypocrisy of it and how 
you know, what this episode I think is all about is just, just how completely, utterly self-defeating and pathetic both Zeon and the Federation look at this point in the Gundam timeline for still doing this kind of shit. And Banerjee being the guy trying to, like, navigate those spaces. Um, it's great. I agree with you about all the stuff in the desert. Um, there's there's this really big conversation they have that I love. And I would love at some point to, like, take a transcript of that entire thing. But there was this one line that I loved that I did tweet out because I said there's a lot of dialogue in Unicorn that catches my breath and kind of makes me pause to consider it and digest. And one of those was where Zinnerman says they're talking about like society on earth and they're looking up at the sky and he says, so to survive, they humanity protected themselves by creating civilization and societies. And Banerjee says, yeah, but those societies got too complicated. And before they knew it, people were forced to live just for the purpose of maintaining the system. And the captain says, in the end, it made life hard to live. And then they transition to talking about colony life. That's one of those lines where it's like Gundam is so good at like this almost like Marxist political thinking of like putting yeah. entire social systems into context. And there's so many great moments like that in Unicorn. Um, and that's one that really hit me. But that entire like fireside conversation and everything with them in this episode is amazing. Yeah, because so much of the stuff in this episode is um, them navigating this stuff with Banaji of like what amount of force is allowable in what like circumstances, um, which is, which is something that like nineties Gundam starts getting into nineties and two thousands Gundam gets into a lot more than the, the earlier stuff where they like never, because the earlier stuff is like war scenarios mostly. Um, but here it is that like, you know, Banaji has killed a couple of people, but he's never really tried to. Um, it's just, you know, if you're in a giant death machine and you start shooting um, the beam magnum, which is a great weapon, but like utterly terrifying. Um, it's like the, the it's a, another thing they do really well, like recapturing the feel of the beam rifle from early Mobile Suit Gundam of like, fuck, man, this thing just murders shit. Like it's so much more powerful a weapon than what anybody else has. Um, so when he, so he has ended up killing a couple of people at this point, um, which is one of the reasons why Banaji is in this depression is because he knows some of the people he's killed. And so he's kind of trying to figure out how to navigate that kind of moral space. And is it okay to kill people in those kinds of situations? Is it not like how much is he perpetuating these, these cycles of violence that he is criticizing by being in the unicorn Gundam and participating in these conflicts? Um, and which is not to say that Unicorn Gundam has like an answer to that question because there is no answer to that question of like what amount of force is acceptable in nuanced circumstances is something we will never, there, there is no way to know the answer to that question. But it is like one of the things about um, the introspective nature of a lot of the stuff in Unicorn Gundam that I like a lot that I, I think sometimes Unicorn Gundam and I'll get into like how this has a certain relationship to Gundam shows from the early 2000s, like Gundam Seed. But I think sometimes it gets a little bit up its own ass. There are a couple of times where I feel like this dialogue ends up feeling like it's saying a lot without saying much. This episode, I don't think has that problem though. I think this episode is the best that that writing is in this show. And, and it really captures a strong sense of character through that introspection. And I am pro Unicorn Gundam getting up its own ass. I love that. So I eat that okay. stuff up. Yeah. But but I understand what you're saying. Um, and the other thing to say about this one is the character of Loni Garvey, which is her full name, who is yeah. the character in the second half at the Torrington Base Massacre. I love that whole scenario. You know, she's only in this one episode, but the whole backstory is that she is the pilot of this big mobile armor, the Shamblo. And there is a Psy Commu system on board. And she basically, the, the whole backstory is that part of why the, the people on Earth are so angry is, you know, they've suffered all these tragedies. And her father is basically, you know, has he's dead and has this, like, had this bloodlust revenge for the Federation for all the horrible things, like, they, all the people they lost. And in the Psycom you system, in the Shamblo, Loni starts, like, having that channeled into her. And that is why she starts indiscriminately massacring this entire city. Um... And that's when Banerjee and Rede both go in to try to stop her. And, like, it's a really interesting situation they put in. Because it is a version of something Gundam has done before. But, with a, but like, pushing the new type stuff another step forward. You've got Banerjee just so utterly diametrically opposed to killing. Like, he cannot, like... 
that is something about him is that he just cannot in his like constitution make himself do that he is too sensitive he is too much of a new type like it causes him we see this multiple times physical pain to see that happening to other people like is the it, it really is that idea of the new type powers being extreme radical empathy you know and what's happening though is that like from Riday's point of view and i think from the audience's point of view is like objectively you've got to put a bullet in that giant mobile armor because it is killing untold numbers of innocent people like Rede is kind of right to be furious with Banerjee here even though he cannot really understand what Banerjee's going through and I like you just come out of this episode sort of feeling like shit which is how the characters come out of it feeling and I think it is one of the best presentations of this kind of scenario in Gundam which is it is it is the Gundam Kobayashi Maru scenario you know where like there is no right answer every choice is shitty how are you gonna you know try to like minimize the damage and is it okay to minimize the damage when that just completely mortgages your soul and that's so, there's so much of that going on here and that there is a cost for Riday to do this like we'll talk about this character one of the things i love about the character of Riday is the path they put him on towards darkness is in part because he's the guy who keeps having to kind of take on the roles that Gundam protagonists often do. He kind of, he takes on all the dark parts of the Gundam protagonist arc and Banerjee gets to go on the side of light a little more. And there's, there's a lot of that going on here. Yeah. Gundam Gundam Show! But then a giant black unicorn drops from the sky. How cool was that, Sean? It's very cool. I like the Banshee Gundam a lot. I think it's a very cool, it's a good design. And it's it's just such a killer. In, in an episode that just feels like there's no possible way there can be a cliffhanger to this. Like you just did the thing, like you, you shot the mobile armor, like that part of the scenario is done. And then <laughs> this other fucking Gundam just drops out of the fucking sky. Um, very good. It's a great ending to an episode. Oh, yes. And episode five is just called... Black Unicorn. It is a very action-heavy episode because it is mostly about Banerjee and some of his friends breaking away from the Federation, forming a new unit with the Nehru Argama and the Garencieris to go continue the Law Plus mission um, because it has become clear at this point that the Federation is up to no good. And so there's a lot of cool action. This has one of my favorite space naval maneuvers in the entire Gundam franchise, which is the We'll talk about it later, but there's a re there's a re entry into the atmosphere scenario that like it deals with like fucking degrees and, and and all sorts of like launch parameters that I fucking love. It's popcorn to me. Um, but yes, there is a lot going on in this one. I don't even know if I could summarize it other than what I said. But one thing to note is that while we see him in episode four, this is definitely the Captain Bright episode. He is in this yeah. a lot. He's in episode six and seven. Um, it is because you were trying to remember last time Sean how much was bright in unicorn it's definitely way more than a cameo he's a major character um, but he is not you know the main captain but I love him here and I wanted to talk about Captain Bright's stuff because I think he has a lot of interesting stuff in this series I like seeing him in kind of a higher command scenario like he's clearly more of like an admiral level at this point than he is just captaining one ship um, and he has a big conversation with Banerjee where he is sort of, because Captain Bright was in all of Gundam, he's the guy who can kind of see the generational thing going on here. He can say the right words to Banerjee. And also, as we always see with Captain Bright, it is always kind of subtext with him, but I love it. Captain Bright is loyal, but he will absolutely kick his side to the curb if he knows they are doing the wrong thing. Because we saw that yeah. in Zeta Gundam, where he um, defected and went to the uh, Ayug. And we see that here, where he organizes a... He orchestrates a situation whereby Banerjee and the Unicorn can get out there and find Laplace's box. Because whatever the fuck the Federation is doing is not working. Um, and with Captain Bright, this was the first production with Captain Bright, where uh, Hirotaka Suzuoki was dead. Um, I said last time I was so worried to have to hear anyone else voice that role because it's such an amazing performance by Suzuoki but I do want to stop and praise Ken Narita who is the actor who plays Bright in these episodes and I think he does such a good job of following up on everything Suzuoki did but also bringing the character forward because the lucky thing is he gets to like kind of take the baton from where Suzuoki left off and go further into the continuity so he gets to lean into the age and wisdom that Bright Noah has and really it sounds like the character evolving not like he had a 
a voice transplant. It's it's a really good takeover of an iconic role. I don't know if I've ever actually heard this kind of handoff of a voice done this well. Yeah, it's like obviously it it will never be as good as if you know Suzuki had 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 lived and and continued to be able to play the role and stuff. But it is it is the best case scenario for something like that. Like it it is hard to imagine someone else being able to play that character um, that well. Yeah, so Kim Narita who. Um, like this is the main thing he's done as Captain Bright, but also in like any of the modern games, he does the Captain Bright voice and that kind of stuff. Um, he does a really phenomenal job. Like, he, yeah, in, in Unicorn Gundam, I'm with you that there's something about the fact that it is an older version of the character. And also like both in the sense of where it is in the timeline, also in the sense of like um, the animation style is so much more modern that like by necessity he just looks different because it's like a digital animated production and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, I think it allows the different voice to sort of sit much more naturally with the character than it would otherwise and it makes it much easier to accept even when like you know, it, it was. I didn't have a hard problem with it at all when I first watched Unicorn Gundam because at that point it had been so long since I had seen any Captain Bright stuff because I had gone through all like all of alternate universe Gundam by that point and and all that stuff. Um, but even having watched f- pretty recently for both of us, Captain Bright like in his prime, um, like it is. It's still I'm like shocked at how well that transfer works. And yeah, his core scene with Banaji in this episode where he gives him the Gundam boy talk um, is very very good. Yeah, I I love it. Also. There is a little detail, but on the raw Kylum, uh, Bright's ship, mm-hmm. which he had in uh, Shars Counterattack as well, he's got an office, and you see it several times. And then I think it's in episode six, he like stops and acknowledges it. He has a picture of Amuro on the wall, and at one point he stops and like says, "I I think I'm doing the right thing, right, old friend, or something like that." Good God, the feelings of Captain Bright, mm-hmm. who is not an outwardly emotional guy putting that Amuro picture on the wall and having that there as something hanging over him every day says so much. And I definitely teared up at that. Yeah, it's it's like the most Captain Bright thing ever is he just... It, I love I love the picture that it is too. It's like this weird glamour shot of Amuro like in a like a jeep. Like it looks it looks like it was when he was on the colony in Shars Counterattack or something. It's like he's wearing the same kind of clothes. He's got this like... You know, I like that. I like that it's not here's Amro like wearing his normal suit or whatever in like the cockpit of the Gundam, like he'd be eating a fucking sandwich or whatever. It's it's no here he is as a <laughs> civilian, just like leaning in his car, um, just just kind of posing, looking a little moody. Um, it's a good it's a good Amro picture, and and yeah, I'm with you that the first time I watched it and this time I definitely teared up when he stops and, and looks at it, and yeah, it's. They're, you know, it's it's Amaro and Captain Bright. It's they're they're the Gundam guys. They're it's the core of that original show. They're some of my favorite characters in anime, so it, it hits me pretty hard. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, you know, you talked about how this is the first digital production Captain Bright is in, so the animation has to be inherently a little different. I love how they deal with. It is not weird in the original shows, but if you have to do it in modern animation. Captain Bright has green hair, and that is a weird thing <laughs> in the original shows, is that you don't even think about it, because that's just something you would kind of do back then in anime, is you could get away with just, like, giving someone blue hair, and it, I don't mean, like, crazy Yu-Gi-Oh green hair, I mean, like, just, like, a subtle green hair, and that's the paint you used, and I don't even know if it's supposed to be green, or if Bright is supposed to have black hair, and they just colored it green, but I like how they straddle the line in Unicorn, where it is black with a green sort of sheen. They did a really good job adapting what is a super 70s anime character into 2000s animation, which could not have been an easy job. Yeah, yeah, because because he's definitely meant to have black hair, but it is it is that old animation or comic books would do this all the time where it's like Superman has blue hair, like he's kind of always had blue hair, but it's but the way that it's painted and colored is it is supposed to be like black with like blue highlights, um, and it's just like it's easier for it to come out on the page that way. Um, and so your brain just very easily fills it in as black. But yes, if you just have it be black, then all of a sudden it doesn't quite look like Superman or it doesn't quite look like Captain Bright anymore because you are like used to having the subtle highlights on it. So yes, they do a good job of 
capturing Captain Bright, um, even with his weirdly subtle green hair that he has. Yes, absolutely. Um, episode five also has, I mean, it has basically the whole thing where the different teams are like meeting up and getting together. Um, I think this is the one where there's, I'm sorry, episode five and six kind of blend together for me because mm-hmm. there is the one where Marita comes back and they have to get her back on their side. Is that episode five or six to your memory? Um, I think that's five because that's. Because she's the one piloting the Banshee when it comes down at the end of, of episode four. Right? Okay. So yes, I think that must be that must be episode five. Yeah, because there's just you get all the stuff with Zinnerman, and this is where you start to get all the stuff about her. She's sort of a surrogate daughter for him, and uh, she he kind of brings her back to reality. And there's a lot of just really beautiful, touching sequences. I think that is episode five. Yeah, um, episode five is like jam fucking packed. Uh, so. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on there. But I did, yeah, because it's, it's. I'm looking at my summary here. Banerjee restrains the Banshee long enough for Zinnerman to board the Garuda. Um, and yeah, it helps with Marida and all that. Okay, so anyway. But I also wanted to talk about episode five. Like I said, one of my favorite like space physics maneuvers. There's a low orbit, low earth orbit maneuver in Gundam Unicorn 5, which is basically where the, the Garitsi area is, is up in low orbit. And the unicorn has to get up far enough with the Nile Argama to like meet them together. I might have the ships reversed, but basically they are going to the unicorn is on top of the ship. They have to get at a certain orbit that they are going to like link the two ships by a tether, by like a cable, and then go together. And it is just everything I love about Gundam action sequences where you have these very detailed, plausible physics where you literally see like the graphs on the screen of like what angle they have to be going at and what speed to reach the point in low Earth orbit where they can make this connection. There's all this good stuff going on there. But then it brings in some great weird new type shit where basically this is where... Uh, Banerjee has his first sort of Axis Shock-esque moment, which he's going to have a lot over the course of the final few episodes, and brings in all this, like, human will, and has the big green flash. This is where the unicorn goes from red to green in all of its weird energy fields, and is able to connect the two ships. And just the image of a Gundam holding on to one ship, and, like, reaching up and holding onto a cable of the other one, and pulling them together, as you have all the weird new type shit going on. I love it so much. I love it so, so much. And this is where, Sean, I finally reached the realization that I find weird new type shit so much vastly more compelling than the Force in Star Wars. Just, if we have Mm -hmm. to do that contest, new types are better. Fucking love it. It's basically like if David Lynch did Star Wars, that's what new types would be. Yes, yeah. It it gets to be more, like, weird and vague. I think partially because of the way that so many different people have kind of like done it and redone it in different ways. Um, and in the way that like Tomino never like it, it and never like really goes fully in on what exactly is new type stuff. Like fucking who knows? Like who like that's and I, and Gundam is best when it is just like, yeah, I don't know. Like, is it actually a like evolution of humankind? Like, do they have, telekinetic powers can they read people's minds are they just like weirdly sensitive to other people's emotions fucking who know knows i like it when when new type stuff stays at about that level yeah so but i love that scene and i just i'm looking through like my contemporaneous notes sean from when i was watching the show and this is where i was i was talking about how much i love the new type stuff because i think that scene in episode five is really really beautiful and i and, and amazing um but I was thinking, I made the David Lynch connection there for myself, and I was I, I tweeted out, and I just wanted to read this, because this is, I think, a good discussion topic. You know how David Lynch almost directed Return of the Jedi? Like, that's a famous mm-hmm. Star Wars story? I feel yeah. like the new type stuff in Gundam is what the Force would look like if Lynch had done that movie, which is resolutely bizarre, inexplicable, extremely dreamlike in its execution, vaguely Freudian, which it always is, and just purely sensory. Um, and then I had the realization, Sean that the movie Lynch did make when he didn't get Return of the Jedi was Dune. And I think Dune is the American movie that is most similar to Gundam in a very weird way. Am I wrong on that? I mean, certainly at the very least, like the weird Bene Gesserit witches and like the power that the spice gives people, um, like that is definitely, it's it's new type-ish for sure. Like the, like... Moadib, my name is a killing word. Like that stuff. Yeah, it it definitely feels like it is adjacent to um, new type stuff for sure. 
Yeah. Just, you know, Hollywood's always trying to make some Mobile Suit Gundam movie. See if David Lynch wants to do it. <laughs> That'd be so weird. Because, <laughs> God, does does Dune have a, like, shot transition that is um, Kyle MacLachlan's, like, weird blue spice eyes, like, over over the desert? I think like, so. In the sky? Because cause that is the, like, classic new type, that's, you know, yeah. of when Amuro stabs Lala and his eyes are superimposed over space. They do the same thing in Unicorn Gundam with a shot with Banaji in episode six or seven. And I'm pretty sure D- Dune does literally that exact same shot somewhere. So, yes. 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 Dune is... Dune, the movie, is weirdly like American Gundam. Yes. I don't think anyone else has made that comparison, so you heard it here first. All right. Episode five's big... Uh, cliffhanger is that they are under attack by the federation forces specifically the general revel he got a ship named after him so good for old general revel uh and then you have uh full frontals forces including his weird like uh number one lieutenant angelo angelo sauper which is a good name uh i love i love that full frontal got himself a garma basically (laughs) he went and found a garma for himself because the the dude who voices angelo is also the guy who voices Garma in Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin. That's great. Which is very, it's very good. Yes, Angelo Sauper. Uh, they, so anyway, episode six starts. Big fight between all of these forces. And then Full Frontal telling the crew they now have time to talk. And episode six, again, I think every episode has its own identity. And episode six is, is these mixed Xeon Earth Federation crews attempting to work together. With also the pressure of Full Frontal doing his own like weird full frontal shit this is the other episode sean where kind of full frontal is in episode two he's not heavily in the series in three four or five and then he comes back in six and this is where we get the next big batch of of exposition about him where we uh where minova basically gets him to explain his motives for laplace's box and full frontal seemingly bears the memories of char from char's counterattack. And he explains that he's sort of in despair over humanity's inability and unwillingness to change after what happened in that film. Especially, I think, the unspoken thing being the Axis shock. And he now wants to use Laplace's box not to open it, but to pressure the Federation into agreeing to a new side co-prosperity sphere. Which would be an economic agreement among all the space noid settlements that would cut out the Earth and therefore economically squeeze the Earth. I find that whole piece of exposition really fascinating, and I love that as the motivation for Xeon at this point. It is also when it is, like, very clear, and Minova says this herself, that this dude is not Char, because that is not a Char Aznavel plan. It's honestly a better plan (laughs) in a lot of ways, because it is an an economic squeezing sort of sanction-based plan is probably the way to do this for the space annoyance. But it is not the kind of big, like, grand ideological action Char as novel would take. No, because Char is, um, he's like a weird idealist. Like, he, he's a man who is both, like, you know, by the time you meet him in Zeta Gundam, like, he has kind of been crushed by the weight of things that have happened. And yet he is still a weird idealist. He's still holding on to trying to find some kind of, like, perfect solution to these problems um, that lead him to, like, extreme places by the time you get to Char's counterattack. Um, and, and yes, like full frontals plan sounds like a, this would probably kind of work like this. This seems like at the very least, it it is a much more actionable thing for the villains to be trying to do than start like space world war two again. You know, it, it, it makes a lot more sense. Um, but it's not, it's, it's like what, um, everyone, multiple characters describe Char in, um, Char's counterattack as being pure, um, that he's, he's too pure a person. And Full Frontal is not pure. This is not a plan made by a pure person. This is a plan made by a weird, like, you know, socioeconomic cynic. Um, And that's kind of how Full Frontal comes across, which is not who Char is at all. I also just love that there's a full, like, 10 minutes of Unicorn Gundam spent discussing the economic, uh, like, outlook of a side co-prosperity sphere. It's just, it's such a weedsy sort of, like, way to look at the political situation of Gundam. And I, I, I can eat that stuff for breakfast. I love it. Um, but then you do have all the stuff of the crews trying to work together. Ultimately, they decide to defy Angelo, who is left in charge. And there's this sort of big fight. The Argama has to get rid of the Neo Zeon people. Um, Bionigi activates the unicorn to sort of aid in the attack. Has to fight full frontal. Um, 
but then uh, uh, Marita, who at this point is kind of redeemed, she reactivates the Kashi Tria to prevent Angelo from destroying the the Argama. Um, and and then that's when she and Zinnerman sort of break away from the sleeves. Um, and there's a lot of really, really good stuff there. Um, so there's a big sort of multi-level action sequence where the sides of this thing really have broken down at this point. Because you also know now the final location of the La Plus program is back on Industrial 7. I also love that, that the La Plus program sent them on a big loop. Um, yep. So that's where they are headed for the for the end. And then... So yeah, you do get a lot of really good, like crazy new type shit here with Marita as well, and and um, some of her stuff. Uh, I think yeah, you haven't seen Rite again because there's there's a little uh, cliffhanger somewhere in here that Rite has gotten the Black Gundam and he is dealing with that. But then that comes into play in the end of the episode. This one has such a good ending where they get back to Industrial Seven. They have like gotten all their supplies together. They have, for Banerjee, a full armor Unicorn Gundam. So that Unicorn Gundam is just decked the fuck out. Like, it has a full, like, set of what look like the kind of rockets you would attach to a shuttle on Earth to get a ship to space. He's basically got all of that. And as he heads out for the final battle, the Unicorn Banshee comes out. Rite is back in the, in the fray. And he is, like, crazy at this point and does a big yell of the word Banerjee. And then it jumps into the best song of all the theme songs. We haven't talked about the theme songs yet. They're all good. But the song for episode six, which is called Re-I-M by the artist Aimer, is a fucking all-timer Gundam song. It's so good. The end of episode six is such a blast thanks to that song. And it's actually on the recent Gundam cover songs album yeah. that, um, oh, what's her name, did. Uh Hiroko Moriguchi. Yes, that's correct. And and her version of that, I think, is actually even better than the original. But they are both really good. And, yeah, so episode six, lots of good stuff. Just wanted to mention all that. Yeah, no, um, like, the, the main thing that stands out to me from episode six is the scene. Because there's the big um, fight scene that is happening in the hangar bay of the Nail Argama. Yes. Um, and there's, a, there's a bunch of great stuff with that. One, I love earlier in the episode, there's a brief scene in that hangar... Um, where they're like kind of they're setting up some of the tensions between um, Full Frontal's crew and the crew of the Nail Argama, and so you have all these different Zeon guys in there and being like, a, "Man, why do they stand up their their mobile suits in the bay of the hangar bay of their ship? Like, man, this is something that only someone trapped by the gravity of Earth would ever think of, because all the Zeon people suspend their mobile suits from the ceiling of the docks um, in their ships." And so I think that's a great detail to have these, like, Zeon dudes just be like, what the fuck are these weird Earth people doing? Like, you're in space most of the time, assholes. You're in a big spaceship. Why are you standing all your fucking mobile suits up, you weird perverts? Um, and that's great. But anyways, at the end of the episode, you're in that hangar again, um, and there's a big, there's the fight against all the different factions of where you have the people of the Nail Argama. You've got Banaji, who is, like, as always, between the different sides. You've got Angelo and the full frontal crew on one side, and then you have... Marita and Zinnerman who are both being pulled um, between each side and that's where Zinnerman gives this big speech of where at first um, he kind of sided with the full frontal crew and stayed with Zeon and he gives this big speech about how hard it is to let that hatred go um, and as he's still kind of swaying from one side or the other before he ultimately decides um, to to join uh, the, the rest of the effort with the Nail Argama to kind of be this neutral middle side and that speech that he gives as he's like tearing up talking about his family um, is really great. It's like the a scene I think about a lot from Unicorn Gundam. One of my favorites, yeah. And it's it's Zinnerman and Marita at this point have just so entrenched themselves as some of the best characters in this series. I There's so much good stuff with them. But yeah. yeah. But then, Sean, we have the finale, Over the Rainbow, which is basically a Gundam movie like I know all of these are sort of movie-esque in that they're all an hour long and they have really good animation but the finale is a full 90 minutes I think takes a step even further up in terms of the animation and music game and just I would put this right on par with all the Gundam movies that we've talked about that you know we like and love and and like either the compilation movies or Char's Counterattack or when we talk about it F91 which is a weird mess but I kind of love it um but yes I just this final episode is so good and like 
Unicorn Gundam puts itself in a weird place where it needs a really good payoff. Like, they can't get away with anything less than great because so much has been pushed to what is Laplace's box, who is full frontal, a lot of the kind of the mysteries they've set up. And I think, I don't know if I've ever seen a show built on a mystery box like this do its ending this incredibly well. It's really fucking good. Yeah, it's, it is really phenomenal. Like, especially once you get, like, to all the stuff of, like, once they get into the colony and you, you re-meet, um, what's his name, Siam Vist, um, yep. the guy who took the the Constitution originally, and then and then all the stuff between Banaji and Full Frontal in this episode is so fucking good yeah. that, yeah, it, it absolutely nails the ending 100%. Yeah, this is probably my favorite episode of the series. I have rewatched scenes from it so many times. It's sort of got three big phases to it. There is the first half hour is basically just like the war, the big battle at Industrial 7 with all of the different sides. You have the Argama crew, you have the Sleeves, you have the Echoist troops, you have other Neo Zeon forces who have kind of surrounded the colony. Um, you start with a big battle between Banerjee and Ride. Uh, Banerjee eventually breaks away and then he has a big fight with Angelo which is a really good fight um, and then he takes Minerva and they go into the colony and kind of the second phase is everything in the colony the big revelations and then I would say the big third final phase is the final battle with Full Frontal and then what's going on with everybody back on Earth where the Vist Foundation who has taken control basically of the Federation Army at this point and has reactivated the Grips 2 laser because that's still out there and are going to fire a big space laser and how that's going to go but I think yeah those three phases are all worth talking about and overall just definitely I would say this one has probably my favorite overall sustained action of the Gundam series is in this episode because I think that initial battle is one of the best presentations they've ever done of a big mobile suit space battle it's it's kind of like you know Solomon or Albaaku just done with modern you know very expensive animation looks amazing um the fight with full frontal at the end is incredible and then goes to some of my favorite new type stuff in the series I don't know Sean where do you want to start breaking this one down Oh geez, um, because because the beginning fight in this episode is that when Marita gets shot down. Is that the beginning? It's in of this that episode? battle, yeah. Because it's yeah. after Banaji breaks away and is fighting Angelo. That is when the like the final phase of that initial battle is Rida starts fighting because Ma Marita is holding Rida back so Banaji can try to get to Industrial Seven because like. They need the unicorn to get there. He's not doing any good on the battlefield, so Marita is holding him back. And when Marita dies here, which is what we're probably going to talk about, is when she sends the psychic message intuiting that there is this space laser threat that is coming to them. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, so one thing that's really interesting about that scene is when Marita dies. Like, the thing that happens after that is extremely similar to Amuro dying in the novel version of the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Oh, uh, specifically the yeah, the new type ghost going to visit all the people um and but like one of his warnings is there is a laser aiming on this position we have to move and I forget I think it's maybe the captain of the nail argument. I forget one of the characters that she like you know, gives a message to, but you only hear their response. The line that he has is like, sounds like a quote from that book. Like it is extremely similar, um, which I'm not sure what to, what to make of that in, in the larger scheme of things. But there's something about that that I found very striking because I just didn't have that context at all the first time I watched it. But the, when Amuro dies in the book in the, the novel version of Mobile Suit Gundam, it is when he is trying to warn people that he has realized that the solar ray is aiming on the position that they're all at right now and that Giren's going to destroy this whole fleet, um, both some of the people left from Xeon and then the Earth Federation people. So there's something cool about them kind of repurposing a little bit of that concept um, for this scene from Unicorn Gundam. It makes sense because they're probably... I do not think Sunrise is ever going to do an adaptation of those books. No, And so doing, even though it might be kind of cool at some point, although it would be traumatic, um, but taking like the probably the most iconic scene in those books, because it is the one that is most different, and uh, putting it into this is really interesting. But that whole sequence with Rite kind of losing himself, and he almost, it's really interesting because they almost get through to him. There's this weird like new type confab 
where Banaji and Merida and um, Minerva and everybody are like getting through to Ride and trying to say, you can come back, we forgive you, stop this. And then in the, in the shot, his gun is floating through space and it hits his hand. And when the gun comes in contact with his hand, he loses it and starts to think of all the things he, he feels like these people have done to wrong him. He takes the gun, overcomes the like new type barrier and just blows up Marida and she sends out that final signal. Um, you see uh, Banerjee like has full body convulsions, like he's like just broken. Um, Ride, I think, starts like vomiting in his helmet. Like it's really extreme yeah. visually. Uh, and there is this big cosmic event because of that one touch i like is the episode of the tv version of unicorn that does all of this is called another cosmic glow which i think is a clever title for this stretch of the show um because it's yeah. a really powerful moment and maybe this is when we should talk sean about rede and and his role on the show yeah so rede is like i like the character like he's i think one of the weaker parts of unicorn gundam to me because i'm not sure if i totally i'm not sure if like the ova structure totally can is good at selling me on his like big character swings because he moves pretty wildly he does. from being a good guy to a bad guy to a good guy again because i mean that's this last episode is he comes in piloting the banshees like banaji and murdering and trying to murder people murders marita and then by the end of the episode or like halfway through the episode he and banaji are teaming up against full frontal and so i think the sh the the ova series is asking a lot of the audience to kind of like commit to that character especially when a lot of the swings that happen is for stuff that you don't really see. Because one of the main things that he kind of says that like causes one of his big kind of villain turns is that he, in at some point off screen, learns what the Laplace's box is. And that's one of the things that kind of pushes him over the edge is kind of realizing the sort of, you know, weird sort of like horrible hypocrisy of everything that has happened for this entire hundred, like the, all the horrors of the conflict, the conflicts that have plagued this entire century are caused by like horrible kind of misunderstandings in this kind of twisting of this like kind of gesture of hope um, and idealism that happened at the beginning of the century that was lost. Um, and so like there's I, I think that there is material there to convince me and do the work to have those character swings um, totally sell for me. I like that is the main part of Unicorn Gundam that I think never really works for me. Um, is particularly because I have seen this exact character arc be done much better in other Gundam stuff. So, like, he ends up feeling like he's a very kind of tropey Gundam character, mostly from a lot of 90s Gundam shows, but his execution is not as good. Yeah, so it works for me, but I don't disagree with what you're saying. Like, I, it is definitely the thing that is most kind of out of step with what you can do in seven and a half OVA hours is he starts as basically just a foot soldier, kind of is like, re, is like you know, Banerjee's buddy. And I think that's part of it is that he and Banerjee have very little time together um, yeah. in the run of the show to fully sell that. He and Minova wind up having more of a, a relationship. But yeah, he goes from good guy to frustrated good guy to full-on wacko bad guy to good guy again at the end i i i it worked for me i do not i don't think i've seen the 90s gundam shows you're referencing if if yeah. i'm thinking correctly so like for me this felt like something of a new character type in in the chronology i've been watching just in terms of him being kind of like cut from a similar mold as our protagonist and being saddled with a lot of the dark shit that a protagonist would usually have to kind of synthesize for themselves and he is kind of getting a lot of the worst brunt of it and then there's also this whole thing with like he is part of the Marcinus family who is sort of like the dark after image of the Vist family um, and that's a whole thread in Unicorn Gundam um, but you know I, I think thematically where it works for me is him being the one who is pushed to the big murdering another new type Lala soon moment, you know, um, and where he comes back from that and sort of how the forgiveness manifests itself in, in Banaji and Minerva and kind of the, the big final battle with full frontal. It worked for me. I think he also has 
the the vocal performance is really good and i think particularly mm-hmm. his he gets the final lines in the series basically where he is the one like chasing after um Banerjee as this like fully evolved new type in the big crystalline mobile suit and trying to like emotionally deal with what he's seen is such a powerful moment um so yeah, I, I think that weakness is there. It's really a structural thing more than anything else. I'm not entirely sure how they could have done it better because I think it is a really important character for the series. You couldn't cut it out or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it worked for me, but I can understand why it would work less for others. That's all I'll say on that. Yeah, because it's not that like I think the character doesn't work at all. I think it's mostly that it's like... Like, it, it feels like you would have needed to make him the protagonist of the show to be able to take that character on that arc and yeah. and kind of sell it. Um, Him being, like, a couple of pegs down the ladder from protagonist means that, like, he he has very violent character swings um off screen multiple times. And that gets a little bit tedious, which, again, like, is something that is exacerbated by the fact that, like... I, I have seen the things that they're pulling that character from. Um, other Gundam shows that that character is kind of pulled from in different ways. And so it's like that aspect of him being like the dark mirror of the protagonist um, that goes on a similar kind of journey and ends up being a villain and then comes back. Like I have seen them do that. And so it is it, it, like that part, the novelty of it doesn't um, kind of work for me because of my context for when I saw it. I also think just... There's, it's something we haven't really talked about yet, but I think the experiential qualities of Unicorn Gundam are so powerful through the yeah. animation and the music and the direction that things like him killing Marita and being broken to the point of being snapped back into his humanity and that radical, like that is what awakens him as a new type weirdly, is doing this horrible thing and being flooded with such empathy he can never be the same. I can I would buy if you said that was not narratively sold because there is a lot as you say there's a lot of character turns that happen off screen. I think the way that what the TV series calls another cosmic glow is done visually directorially experientially and like the bodily violence of it on the people who are like in the vicinity and feeling like the empathetic waves is so powerful and hits me so hard. It it, it really does feel like a modern animation version of the kinds of things original Gundam did, particularly in the Cosmic Glow episode. And so there's a lot of stuff with the character that I buy just because I think they do it on a production level so well. Yeah, and I think I think that is also how I feel about it, that like he works for me, generally speaking, in this episode. It's more a lot of the journey along the way, yeah. I think, was like that's where the problems happen, is like to get him to this point, like that's the part that was messy once you get here and the way that they pull it off with like the production stuff that they have available to them um yeah once we get here i'm basically fine with him because all of his stuff in this episode is really good all this stuff with like yeah him shooting marita and then fucking throwing up in his helmet and then him fighting alongside with banaji and then having those last lines of him like like don't go without me like banaji like come back like stay here with us like that stuff works for me really well it's more like the, the it's you know if we're at like point d and we start at point a it's the b and c that doesn't quite work for me i can totally see that so part 2 of this episode they go to the Magagelica, what? Okay, the Magalanica. It's the it's the basically the big part of the ship that houses of Industrial Seven that houses the charter and the the Laplace's box. The yeah, right. Magalanica um, is this whole part is so interesting. It, it 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 is pushed to, and so much of this episode is pushed to a very metaphysical place where it's almost like the characters are ascending to another plane and like meeting a vision of God which is kind of how it works. But yes, you have Siam Vist, who is the old dude basically kept in like some kind of like frozen storage almost and his handler and we and Minerva and Banaji get there. They have proven themselves worthy because that was the purpose of the Unicorn Gundam was to test someone's new type ability. Banaji has very clearly proven himself as a new type and so they can learn what Laplace's box is. And Laplace's box is the original Universal Century Charter which states as the final article 
that if humans evolve or a new type of human kind of comes into existence in the new space future of humanity, they must have a voice in the representation of Earth government. And that was erased by the Federation following the Laplace incident. And that has been their dirty, dark sin ever since. And I thought that was kind of a brilliant thing for Laplace's box to be because it is simple. It is not a literally earth-shattering revelation like like i was thinking they might do a very sci-fi thing of some kind of cycle like this isn't the first universal century or something because that would be such a trope for this kind of anime but gundam is smarter than that and it really is something as simple as there was this promise that was made and it was erased and not kept and it is more about the implications of what that would mean and all the things that were allowed to go by in its absence than it is about the literal power of this document. Um, I think it's pretty much the perfect way to resolve the Laplace's box mystery. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's such a good idea. And specifically, like, it's the nuances of what that means because, because this is not new types. Like, it's not, like, when they created that charter, um, like, Zeon Zoom Daikun was, like, probably not even born yet at that point. They, no, certainly he wouldn't have been if... if you know, he dies sometime in, like, the, the, the 70s in the Universal Century. Um, so, like, his whole new type theory, that's not a thing. Like, this is just them saying, like, if if this, le if in, like, very vague terms, if at some point far in the distant future, there, like, something like this happens, like, then, um, then we can, you know... We'll, we'll have that discussion and, and we will make space for our new, like, evolved humanity. And then after that is when the new type theory stuff starts happening. And that's where the Earth Federation government's like, oh, shit, we definitely cannot allow this to be a thing. We cannot allow people to know that this was, like, an idea we had. Because instead of it being some distant, far-off concept, it's something that, like, might start happening in a couple of decades based on like the the philosophies that these people are talking about and that nuance of it i like a lot of that it is the original thing that they were saying was not like we're going to make a government for we're going to allow like the new types to participate in the government it's like you know no vaguely like there there's some hope for humanity to change and grow in the future and we're recognizing that and once the reality of that came home to roost and the people who were actually had power in the earth federation were like oh shit, this is not something that's going to happen, you know, for our great, 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 great grandchildren. This is like a situation that's kind of in front of us now. We, and, and then they get greedy and just hold on to their power still. Um, like that, that element of it is something that feels very Gundam, that feels very rooted in the, the ways that I think Gundam kind of perceives human society in the ways that like, um, people in society cr try to sort of crave and hold on to the power that's available to them. And it also, you know, so much of Unicorn Gundam is spent on people saying, you know, Laplace's box is something with the power to take down the Federation. And it being this little secret with big implications, you know, once you start thinking about those implications and the episode starts thinking about those implications... Obviously, yes, oh, this could take down the Federation because it reveals something about all of the wars that we have seen, which is that the Federation was holding on to this secret that makes their position in a lot of these conflicts fundamentally illegitimate in a lot of ways, like, or at the very least, hypocritical and power hungry. And I think I was very happy to see it shine such a light on the bad things about the Federation because... The Federation in every Gundam show is shown to be fucked up in one way or another. The only time they are the outright villain is really Zeta Gundam. And even then, it's not... like The Titans are a, are an offset of the Federation. Um, but it's pretty clear like something needs to happen to this group. Like it is a bad thing for humanity to have this central government that is so corrupt and calcified. And I think this idea of going back to like, what were the first principles of this government we were trying to build? What did we ignore? What did we focus on? And asking about, you know, what do we want to be into the future? 
is such a beautiful way of looking at things. It is so applicable to the world we live in today in on the actual planet Earth. Uh, I like the way it is described by multiple characters in this episode. Minova latches onto this reading of that article was a prayer to the future. It was a yeah. hope. It is not necessarily a literal governing philosophy, but it is something that it is better to live by that hope than to try to drown it out and ignore it and maintain the status quo because doing all of those things has just continually enabled villains. And I think like that gets to the root of what is wrong about the Federation in Gundam is that the Federation, other than in Zeta when they are enabling the Titans who are evil, the Federation is never the worst thing we see. They are usually the lesser of two evils, but they are very much an evil for how much they are maintaining a status quo and a bad status quo that is exclusionary to a lot of people and is leading to these perpetual conflicts. And at any point, if the Federation had taken steps to really address these problems that they had and embrace some kind of change in the world, then maybe we don't have a first, second, and third neo Zeon war, right? Yeah. And that, to me, says so much about like current politics. Like, I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but I have been... Okay, so Sean, you and I are recording this on, what is it, September 22nd, 2019, just so people know when we're talking about this. We are at a dark time in American politics. We've talked about that on the show before, and how much certain things like the Titans in Zeta Gundam mirror things in our current world, right? Yeah. And one thing I've been thinking about a lot too, though, is that like, we're also in a moment where I would say it is fair to say that a lot of people who are politically inclined like you and me are very, 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 very deeply frustrated with, let's say, the Democratic Party in Congress um, for being the group that is refusing to use the power that they have actually won by the will of the people to try to do something to change our dangerous and deadly status quo. And that has been such a disheartening thing. And at times, to me at least, is even more disheartening than what I think the real villains on the other side are doing because you expect the bad guys to be the bad guys. You want the good guys to try to do something about it. And when you realize, oh, maybe they're not good guys. Maybe they're just not as bad guys. That's when you feel really, really sick and bad inside. And I feel like there's a way to to apply Gundam to current American politics to me where I continue to see like the Federation as an old calcified Democratic Party that won't mm -hmm. actually fight for the things people want them to fight for. And all these bad things keep going on on the other side. And it's like, that's all horrible. We need to address that. But at some point, we've got to come back to this party that keeps letting this shit happen. And I think there is something in the idea of there is this prayer to the future that we need to embrace and fight for. And we haven't. And that is why we have fucked up time and time again. That is why Unicorn Gundam is so politically resonant. And I'm applying it to our current situation in America. I'm not saying anyone involved with Unicorn Gundam intended that. That's just a way you can apply some of what you're seeing here because that's what fiction is for, is maybe helping you work through the real world. Um, but this show definitely helped put a fine point on this resonance I kept feeling moving through the Universal Century Gundam stuff and this application to real-life politics that is on my mind much of the day these days. No, absolutely. I mean, yes. Like, I agree with all of that, that it is something where... Because because it is not just a like modern American politics thing. Like the Earth Federation, I think, is very intentionally designed to be the like you know remnants of like the it's it's like the dark conclusion to many democracies is that like the the impasse and that like corruption has eventually like worked its way so deeply into the political system that the people who have power are not the people that should have the power. And they are people that are not interested in, in changing the status quo because they benefit the most from the status quo. Um, and so even if they are invested with power from the people democratically, they're still going to ultimately work in their own best interests. Right. And they're going to they're they're not one. They don't want to shake the boat too much because shaking the boat too much could eventually have negative consequences for themselves, um, regardless of like what kind of political mandate or political action should be taken based on their position and the position they have been put in democratically, like through election. Um, and, and that is like, while like, you know, Gundam doesn't dig deep into the, the full like political machinations of what the earth Federation is. That is the background of what the earth Federation has always been since the original mobile suit Gundam is, it is this corrupt distant, 
um, sort of um, stony democracy that has very little capacity to enact any sort of positive change in the world and only exists to sort of create and perpetuate a specific kind of status quo, which is a status quo that very aggressively is um, negative for anybody living in space because they have absolutely no political say and gain no real political benefit from their relationship with the Earth Federation. And that has always been the political setup of Universal Century Gundam. And so, yeah, like that 100% applies to modern American politics. Like I'm not super well-versed in Japanese politics, but the little that I do know suggests to me that that is also true of Japan and has been for a while. Yes. And so, yeah, it's... Gundam is very good, and like when Gundam is very good, it's very like politically astute. Even when it doesn't seem like it's doing a lot of that stuff, like in the original Mobile Suit Gundam, which is of the shows we've watched, the one that is the most distant from discussing actively the politics in the setting. Like even the original Mobile Suit Gundam has a lot of this stuff in it, which is stuff that we talked about when we talked about it on this podcast. So, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's it's baked in from the start. I mean, it's just like the the basic political setup of the Universal Century is so ripe for like application to a variety of modern political situations that mm -hmm. the shows themselves have been able to bend and twist into new permutations where they can do that in new and interesting ways. But it's always been there. Yeah. So I yeah. So that is Laplace's box. Full frontal re-enters the picture. He and Banaji gonna fight, and they, my friend, will see the tears of time. We wanna talk about the big, big final fight here, Sean? Yeah, so this is where Unicorn Gundam goes fucking nutso in a bunch of different ways. One is just the the Sananju like inserted into this gigantic, just massive, fucking ridiculous mobile armor. Um, and the Unicorn Gundam and the Banshee Gundam having to fight it. Um, and in particular, like once you start getting to the point where the tears of time st stuff starts happening and the unicorn Gundam is like literally just like in there ripping out chunks of the mobile armor, which is so good. It feels like they're like, they, they capture a thing from the ghost in the shell movie of having the mechanics feel like fleshy and like, like it feels like flesh in muscle and tendon. He's just ripping out cables and all this shit. And it's very, it's just, there's a couple really good shots of that that yes. are great. Um, and this is just where there's like just giant lasers shooting all over the place and missiles flying everywhere. Like this is the most bombastic action sequence Gundam has ever done. Like it gets very close to being like like outside of the real robot genre almost with how over the top the shit you're seeing is. Like it's this is like this is one of the sequences that where I would point to when I say stuff like it does not make sense to me that Gundam F-91 happens in the same timeline where this shit occurred because, like, the combat in Gundam F-91 is, like, not this. Like, it's it's pared down even from where Char's counterattack is, where it's like they've made the mobile suits more compact. It's more ground level. Like, it's, it's smaller scale. It's like here... You've got, like, a mobile armor the size of, like, a fucking city or something ridiculous. And the the Unicorn Gundam basically going Super Saiyan. And just, like, giant colony lasers firing all over the place. And, like, here's a million missiles getting shot. Like, it's, it's so extreme that it is very hard for me to imagine that... That F-91 and Victory Gundam, that stuff happens later in this timeline. When this is the kind of fight we're seeing now. Like, it, it's like saying you go from... Like, go Super Saiyan Goku fighting Frieza, and then the next arc in Dragon Ball is, like, a bunch of people. And it's, it's like, you know, Goku versus Ten Shin Han from the second martial arts tournament. It's like, yes. you can't go back. You can't go backwards. Like, it doesn't make it sense anymore. Like, the continuity just has been, like, twisted in a weird way. No, and I totally see that. And I want to have a little discussion later on about how Unicorn might fit into timelines and what we do with that. Because I do think it's an interesting discussion to have. But, yes, I... I love how far Unicorn pushes it at the end here. It goes so insane. The mobile armor, or whatever you want to call it, because I don't even know if mobile armor is the right term for how crazy it is, that full frontal pilots... I One, I'm not sure it fully makes sense that Neo Zeon would have access to that fucking thing, because that... Oh, no. Like, they've lost, like, four fucking wars at this point. How could they possibly have the resources to build this fucking thing? Yeah, but I love that it's there. Because it is, it is the closest Gundam gets to something like fucking Unicron in Transformers, right? Like, yeah. it is... Mm -hmm. It's not the size of a planet. 
it might be the size of a fucking moon. I mean, it's enormous because the Sinanju is already probably as big a mobile suit as we've seen, I think would be fair to say. And then you take the Sinanju and it goes in like the helmet area of this thing and it looks tiny. It looks, it's like it is person sized to another full mobile suit. So it's like a fucking Russian nesting doll of person inside a mobile suit inside a bigger mobile suit. And like, there's a point where Banaji is just ripping arms off and more arms come out because it's got so many arms and, and things going on. And so the fight itself is insane. As you say, the mobile suit itself basically goes Super Saiyan at one point with the, with the Unicorn Gundam. And then, yeah, Full Frontal just takes them on a journey through time and they see the entire run of violence in the Universal Century dating back to the destruction of Laplace while the well, a amazing orchestral cover of the Daisuke Inoue song Beginning from the third Gundam movie plays. And I think I just about had a seizure and died watching that scene because it was so good and so fucking mind-melting, Sean. Yeah, it's really amazing. Like all the like seeing these brief glimpses of a bunch of like the really iconic scenes from the original Mobile Suit Gundam of like Lala getting stabbed and um, them taking out the big Zam. Um, There's this like, great shot where you see the Gundam yeah. drop down with its sword onto the big Zam, and it's in like the corner of the scene as they're moving by it. Yeah. So and then it going to like the Laplace incident and like that terrorist attack and the explosion and all of that. Um, yes, while the beginning song plays, which is something that the first time I watched this, I had never seen the Gundam movies, so I had no context for that song at all. So on second viewing, getting that, like, connection, because I have listened to all those Daisuke Inoue songs so many times They're since so we did good. that podcast. They're such great fucking songs, man. And, yeah, and so having that, the big swell of the chorus of beginning, particularly when that goes, it is... It like it, it literally like sh- sent chills down my spine kind of thing. And it has every one of the dozen times I've watched it since. Because near mm-hmm. the end of that scene, the chorus is still swelling. And Char, uh, Full Frontal, says to Bonaji, this is where it all begins. So you can see it as well. Um, I'm going through the subtitles here. In that case, let us travel together to the end of time in this universe, Bonaji-kun. And oh my god. And then they come back and you get... The next moment of this sequence where, yes, this is where Bonaji starts ripping pieces out and you get him pushing against the suit and Full Frontal says he starts to feel warmth and you get the voice of Lala. And you get, I think, one of the most extraordinary moments in Gundam where the spirits of Shar and Lala show up and then the the Sinanju and the big mobile armor around it just turns to like rusted, corroded metal the unicorn leaves and you hear Toru Furia say, is it time? And Shuichi Keita says, yes, let's leave this to them. And all three colored spirits go into like this weird colored line together and go up into a swan shape like Lala and depart this universe. And that little capper to Shar and Amuro and Lala and seeing basically their departure if everything else in Unicorn Gundam sucked, it would be worth it for that moment. Yeah, like I, I have teared up every time I've watched that sequence because there's something, it's so perfectly executed. One, just like the dialogue that Lala has to Full Frontal, particularly she has like, I think the last line that she says to him is this great of like, where, because Full Frontal's kind of like protesting a little bit and she says like, they've heard everything you had to say when you were here. Yeah. Um, because, when you were because, you like, is what you know, she says. While full front... Yes, yes, when you were you. Because this is where also you at this point you the show has fully told you that Full Frontal is a clone of Char that seems to have like it literally served as the vessel for like part of Char's like new type kind of memory. Like that that, you know, when Char died he left something behind. And so like Full Frontal was that clone but then he has kind of taken up this very literal mantle of the Red Comet of Char and is like 
it's it's you know he is the ghost of Char like holding on to something that he needs to learn to let go of and Lala kind of giving him permission and saying that yeah like they've heard everything that you've had to say when you were you and then it's the ghost of Char fr- like dressed in you know dressed to the nines in his full original get up like kind of like tapping full frontal on the shoulder as he goes by um, and yeah and then you get they got Todu Fudia in to do the one line he just says Inoka. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah, it's like, is it okay? Is it time? Like, can we move on? And he says, yes, it's time. And then they, they all fly together. And it's like, oh my God. Oh, it's so good. Like for a thing that like, again, another thing that normally I would, my gut reaction, if you told me about it would be, they shouldn't do this. They shouldn't like, they shouldn't like wrestle up the ending of Char's counterattack, which again, like when I first watched Unicorn's Gundam, Char's counterattack was something I had seen like eight plus months earlier and I had gone through so much Gundam between Char's Counterattack and the time I watched Unicorn Gundam which Unicorn was one of the last Gundam things made by the time I had caught up um and so f- for me like I would have thought no like you should like Char's Counterattack such a perfect ending let that rest don't address anything about it um and most things I think bringing trying to bring that stuff back up would fuck it up and Unicorn Gundam absolutely nails it. Like, this is the perfect amount. Like, it's just just a little bit. Just that little suggestion, and then that's all you need. And then leaving behind, like, the husk of Full Frontal's body in the husk of that mobile suit. Um, because Full Frontal, like, nothing has killed him. He has just moved on. Um, it's so good. It's so good. It is... It feels like the ultimate... This, and then what is going to happen with Banaji at the end of the episode feels like the ultimate realization and payoff to all the new type stuff we've been seeing in a way that Unicorn Gundam feels like kind of a grand finale to a version of the Gundam timeline through this point that I think, we'll talk about this later, but I think in my conception of it at this point, F91 is an alternate timeline. Like you kind of have to see them as a split because Mm -hmm. I think the, the future of the Universal Century after Unicorn Gundam and what we see here just fundamentally could not be what we see elsewhere. Like, Zeon Zoom Daikun's vision has come true to some degree at the end of Unicorn Gundam, and that payoff being there is something I don't know if I could have vocalized I needed at some point, Sean, but I did need it. And I think Char's counterattack gives you a version of that, no doubt, that's definitely there in the Axis shock at the end. But I think doing an even bigger version of it where you can see the world kind of react to it to a certain degree moves me so immensely I can barely even vocalize it. I love it. I love it so much. And yeah, and that absolutely. is yeah, and that is the finale that we have to talk about, which is that the Grips Colony Laser fires. Uh, Bright does his best back on Earth to stop them, but he isn't able to. The... Bright has that great line where they're about to fire the laser and he says, if you do this, you will make an enemy of me for the rest of my life, which is the, and like, and everybody else in that room is so shook. And it's this great, just like, this is, this is the guy who had won the one year war. He won the grips conflict with the AU. He, he's won both Neo Zeon wars. Um, and he's, he, while this is not, you know, he's not the one who's winning the third Neo Zeon war. He's, he's done his fair part in this one as well. You don't want to get on this dude's fucking bad side. Trust me. And, yes. And I love that line so much. I love the idea of a Captain Bright who full well knows who he is to these people. Like he is a walking legend. He carries that with him. And like, he is a humble man. So he doesn't like put it out there much, but if he needs to, he will flex on them. Yes. Yeah. It's like, if you do this, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to find another fucking Gundam boy and I'm going to fuck your shit up. (laughs) That would be so funny if he actually said, I will find another Gundam boy. But anyway, like, I found like seven of them. Yeah, I'm like come on, like let's do this. Come on, fucking fucking punch me. Gundam boys are a renewable resource. Um, yeah. All right, great stuff. The laser fires. Banaji and Rede get together, and they do some kind of crazy new type shit to create these like physical barriers, and then Banaji goes to another plane of existence, basically. Um, the, the voice actor drops out of the episode for like the next 20 minutes um, mm-hmm. because we don't hear him again until the final line of the series where he says, 
Odori, but we'll get there. Um, and and the unicorn basically, because we don't even actually see what's going on inside the cockpit. Something happens. The energy calcifies and crystallizes around the unicorn Gundam, and he is able to basically negate the light energy from the laser. Uh, and then later in the episode, he will also, with a sweep of his hand, negate like an entire fleet of mobile suits, which is one of the crazier images Gundam has ever given us. Uh, and it is magnificent. That's what I mean when I say this feels like the culmination, because like that feels like a moment of like humanity has force evolved into something else, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is definitely, it is, it, yeah, it is the thing that makes it just feel like there's no way for other stuff to be set after yeah. this point because you can't you can't really go back you know you can't like once once you have taken taken the new type stuff this far which i will say like there is a part of me that is a little bit resistant to just how how extreme it is like i don't really have a big deal with it like i i have i have gotten over the gundams going super saiyan thing a long time ago um because th this is like one of my original um, misgivings with the ending of Zeta Gundam was that Zeta Gundam does the Gundam going Super Saiyan thing with new type power, um, which in my heart of hearts, I will always prefer the new type stuff to be so abstract that like, that's not like the only, the only time a Gundam should be able to go Super Saiyan is if it's in Mobile Fighter G Gundam, where it literally turns gold and it's called Super Mode, where, and which is, it's just them being Super Saiyan because G Gundam is great and dumb. And that's the martial arts one. So that, that one gets a full pass on Super Saiyan Gundams because they're literally Super Saiyan Gundams. Otherwise, like I would prefer if Gundam avoided it. That being said, almost every fucking Gundam show does it. Um, Zeta Gundam does it. Double Zeta does it. Char's counterattack doesn't really, but like the Axis Shock is sort of close. Um, um, then you go to what? Like Gundam Wing sort of has a version of it. G Gundam has a version of it. Gundam Seed has it all over the place. Double O Gundam has it all over the place. Turn A Gundam has it. Point being, most Gundams have some, whether you call it Trans Am, whether you call it new type bullshit, whether you call it like Seed Mode, whether you call it like NTD Mode, whatever your weird fucking thing is, most Gundam shows have some kind of Super Saiyan Gundam. Um, they, in my heart of hearts, I, I, I am still a little bit resistant to, to, to the mobile suits being able to exert power at this scale. I kind of prefer there to be that stronger dichotomy between the new type stuff is something that the human has and the machine is something totally external from that. I like that setup from the original Gundam, but most Gundam stuff doesn't really do it that way. Yeah, you can't be too resistant to it, Sean, because otherwise you would not be a Gundam fan. You would be a fan of one Gundam show. <laughs> from exactly, like yeah. In, in ideally, I would have I would have liked more Gundam stuff to have kept the setup that Mobile Suit Gundam went with. Um, but because ultimately, it also is something that only manifests in like usually near the end of whatever Gundam thing it is. So even if it bugs me, it will only bug me for like two minutes or whatever, you know. Because here's my view: I yeah. felt that same resistance at Zeta Gundam. And then I think Zeta Gundam builds it to such a powerful ending that, like, I immediately got over Like, I felt the resistance in the moment and also got over it in the same moment because I saw the potential of what they were doing with it. And from that point on, to me, it's like, if you're gonna do... If you have opened the new type box, as the original show does, and you are going to continue telling stories, I think you kind of have to get to this point eventually. Like... You have to get to the Axis Shock. And if you get to the Axis Shock, you kind of have to go bigger than that. You can't put that back in the box and pretend it didn't happen. Like, so I am A-OK -okay with them continuing to expand as long as there is, I think, a consistent sort of like philosophical basis for it that feels thematically true to what Gundam is. And so far, all the new type stuff I love has done that. And I think Unicorn fits, fits in that evolution very nicely for me. Um... But it is also, I think, a culmination. I, I agree, and we'll talk about this, like, F-91 and the stuff that comes after that. Uh, I can't speak to Victory Gundam, but I can speak to Crossbone Gundam. Just, they reset in a certain way because, uh, like, Char's counterattack is very clearly an inflection point from which you can kind of go one of two directions. And I think we've seen both directions now in the two sort of continuations we have. One being Unicorn, one being F-91 onwards. Um, but, you know, this kind of stuff, I think, just... You and I can speak to this in our history of doing podcasts together. I know this kind of thing works more for me than it probably does for yeah. you. That's just a personality thing we have. Um, 
But yeah, it's it's part of why I love Unicorn Gundam so much is how much it commits itself to it. And, you know, one of the great things about Gundam is if this isn't quite your flavor, there's a lot of other Gundams that probably are. So yeah. that's the great thing. Um, yeah, uh, I love it. It's it's so bizarre and out there. And yeah, works for me. And the ending is so extraordinarily beautiful. I love the the unicorn like soaring through space, leaving this blue trail and Rede, who I think is a new type at this point, but is clearly on a different plane than, than Bonaji is following behind and feeling left behind. And he has this whole speech about like, no, come back here. You know, I'm going to steal Audrey from you. Banaji! And then you go into the cockpit and you see like Banaji with his eyes rolled back and he stirs a little bit and you see there's still some humanity in him as he says, Odori. And then the final theme song, also by Aimer, Star Ring Child, which is also really fucking good, kicks in and they both fly back to the... Well, first the crystallization disappears and like re comes into the body of the Gundam and then they fly back together. Uh, and I'm forgetting the other major thing of this sequence, of course, is that the last 10 minutes is all intercut with Audrey giving her big speech uh, to, to the world, basically, to all of humanity about Laplace's box and... You know, in some ways, this feels like, to me, in my experience watching, like, the end of the Universal Century arc of Gundam. You know, of, like, everything I've seen so far, this feels like the culmination, and the rest is for your imagination. And then, as I said, F-91 is an alternate timeline or something, you know? Mm -hmm. But the music that plays over this last sequence, the production values, the kick into the Star Ring Child song, boy, I... It's such it's so good. It's such a good, beautiful ending. And it's it it's it's such it's such a fulfillment of all the things Unicorn is that other Gundam shows aren't and makes Unicorn so unique is this big cinematic metaphysical swell that I, I love so much. It's a hell of a fucking ending. Like it is yeah, like that all that stuff, the particularly just it's just like the the production execution, like the pacing and the direction of that whole sequence and, and the suspense of which especially for me because since it's been like three years or whatever, but yeah, about three years since the last time I watched Unicorn Gundam, I couldn't quite remember exact like does does Benaji, is Benaji still a human? Because there's there there's another Gundam thing that has a very similar sort of ending, and I kind of couldn't remember which one did which thing, so I'm like what the fuck happens to Minaji at the end? So I was still in suspense on my second being like, is he still okay? Or is he like a weird crystal man? Like, what's going on? What is the ending of the show again? I don't remember anymore. Yes. So good. Um, man, I mean, we've got to move on to Narrative Gundam. But is there anything else to say with... I mean, there's always more to say. But yeah. respecting that this will be a finite podcast, what else do we want to say about Unicorn Gundam at this point? Um, I want to shout out very quickly Otto Midas, who is the captain of the Nail Argama. Um, I and like him. Then, yeah, he's great. And then the guy, the the guy who's the from Anaheim Electronics, who falls in love with Marita, um, Alberto. Um, both of them are great because um, Otto is voiced by the guy who plays Uchiha Madara from Naruto, and then the other guy, the Vist guy, is voiced by the guy who plays Toby. Uh, from Naruto, who those two characters in that show are also paired together in a way that is like weirdly reminiscent of these two characters in here. And I was like, I don't think I had watched, I had gotten to the part in Naruto um, where those characters appear the first time I watched Unicorn Gundam. So when I heard those voices, which are two of my favorite vocal performances from that show, I was like, oh my God, that's fucking like, cause they're not in a lot of stuff. So it was like, oh my God, it's those two characters and they're in the same show that they have a lot of dialogue together and it's giving me a lot of good Naruto feelings. So if you like Naruto, you probably had that feeling as well watching the Unicorn Gundam. Yes. Awesome. Um, I wanted to say something but now i've forgotten what i wanted to say so i don't know you know i will also say one of the best parts of the show that we did not talk about was the part where um gail chan who is um cardius Viss's um like bodyguard dude from the episode one yeah you see him again in episode seven and then he gets into a dope mobile suit called the silver bullet 
and he fights uh, Char or Full Frontal in it for a little bit. And that is a great part where that dude goes and gets into like a mobile suit that like comes up out that of the is ground, really like good. onto the lawn of the manor. And I'm like, this dude, I want a whole fucking OVA series just about this fucking dude being a dope butler that also is a great mobile suit pilot. That moment yes. was amazing. Okay, so I remember what I wanted to say to kind of help wrap this up. Um, like, what do you imagine the future of the Universal Century would be after Unicorn Gundam? Uh, and, and, like, Narrative Gundam fills in a little bit, but it's set, like, a couple months later. Like, you couldn't use it yeah. as a baseline for where ultimately things would go. Because I... Ve- and this, I think, also plays into the discussion of how do you kind of headcanon all of this in the timeline? Because... I definitely don't see F91 and and its followers kind of happening the same from this point because F91 and then what goes on after that is very clearly in a world where the Federation just kind of continues to weaken from entropy over time after Char's counterattack. Mm-hmm. Whereas I do think the events of Unicorn Gundam would fundamentally shatter the existing world order in some way or another. Yeah, or at the very least, there's a sense of like, if you continue on the trajectory of the new type stuff and this is like, you know, new typeness has gone so far by the time you get to the Unicorn Gundam. Like again, the Unicorn Gundam sweeps its hand in an entire battalion of mobile suits just shut down. Yeah. Um, you find out in Narrative Gundam that what happened is that the, the reactors inside the mobile suits literally were dismantled. Um, like that is a scale of power that is exists nowhere else in um, Gundam. I think there's maybe I can think of two things. I don't even want to say where they're from out of spoiler stuff. I can think of two things in other Gundam shows. One of them is from G Gundam that is maybe at that power level, and even then, maybe those things aren't quite that that scale. Um, so, and certainly nothing in F ninety one or Victory Gundam is anything like that, like anywhere close. Like Uso, the main character from uh, Victory Gundam, is a powerful new type, but he's not like this. Like he's more to scale of like a Camille or a Judo, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So like, I think the vision that Unicorn Gundam has is like the new typeness continues on a certain kind of trajectory and it becomes more extreme over time. And I think Tomino's continuation is more like the whatever the culmination of new typeness is that's still somewhere in the future it's not like a it's just like getting better over time or like people are getting more new typey over time it is it is still more vague it is still more kind of up and down and and a little bit kind of more all over the place and so that's one of the things i think is like part of the competition between those two visions is unicorn gundam is saying nope this stuff is like happening at an accelerated rate and and it will probably continue to do so and i agree with all of that because having watched f91 and read i've read most of crossbone gundam the because crossbone gundam just short long story short has a couple of series that are like its original run with its characters and then it jumps way in the future and it is still called Crossbone Gundam but it's a separate series. I've read most of the original Crossbone Gundam. And yeah, the original six volumes. Yeah, there's six volumes and there's a sequel called Steel 7 that is three volumes that like finishes off those characters. Um, and I've read, yeah, I'm, I've done the six volumes and I have to do Steel 7. But um, like between F91 and Crossbone Gundam, I love both of those in different ways. One frustration I do have, and I wonder if it will carry over to Victory Gundam, is I do feel the new type stuff starts to feel repetitive when it feels like just different permutations of what we've seen so far with no particular ramping up. And I don't know if that will continue for me into Victory Gundam or not, but it's something that I do appreciate Unicorn Gundam feeling like it provides some kind of like capper and catharsis on all of it. Um, Overall though, I like kind of both approaches, but I agree with everything you said. And I think it is the new type stuff. I also think the Minerva we meet in Unicorn Gundam would be such a political player going forward. I don't think I can view F91 and that stuff happening without her because F91 is not as far in the future as I think you've been saying, Sean. It's 123. So it's only about 25, 30 years later than this. So Minova would still be like in her 50s. She would be perfectly like capable of ruling. And I feel like there is... Because Crossbone Gundam particularly deals a lot with power vacuums that have happened in the world. And I feel like Minerva, if we had her in Unicorn Gundam, would be such a question mark out there. Like, that person would clearly be building some kind of political faction and bringing followers to her. 
I it's hard to imagine a future scenario where you're telling stories where that's not a factor. Um, and again, this is not me criticizing the F-91 timeline. I'm just commenting on the differences here. And so that's another reason why I feel like Unicorn is pretty incompatible with the other UC stuff that comes after this. Yeah, because like F-91 and Victory Gundam basically just sort of suppose a world where, where like Xeon ceases to exist effectively. Yes. Like the tensions between Earth noids and Space noids will continue because it, like, it will always continue in Gundam as long as there are Earth noids and Space noids. There will be some conflict between them. But, it, but like the Xeon element of it is completely gone. Um, and yes, like I think Unicorn Gundam shows a very different vision of where whether or not Nineveh would like, I don't know, keep the Xeon name or something like she is going to be one of like the major leading factions in for the space noids for her whole lifetime, you know? So yeah, like, like F91 just kind of, while it is not actually literally set that, that much further in the timeline, it is experientially, it might as well be something different, right? Yes. Like it is, it is, it is so removed from the core conflicts, um, and the specific conflicts that drove everything from Mobile Suit Gundam to Shars Counterattack, that like, and there are no characters that cross over from those shows, that like, it might as well be something else. Yeah, and I think that's my headcanon at this point is, have you seen, I'm sure you've seen this, Sean, the Legend of Zelda official timeline that branches after Ocarina of Time? Yes, 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 yeah. So so if you haven't seen this, the, the Legend of Zelda official timeline as laid out in Hyrule Historia goes basically, it would have to be updated at this point, but it's like Skyward Sword, um, Minish Cap, Ocarina of Time, and then Ocarina of Time, depending on the events of that game because of its time travel thing, the Zelda timeline splits in multiple directions. I feel like you've kind of got to do that for Universal Century Gundam, where I think you would say, everything shoots through Shars Counterattack, we can agree on. And then post-Axis Shock is where you would have a pretty clear split. And I think there's like the Unicorn timeline and the F-91 timeline. And I, the thing is, I can buy both timelines after Char's Counterattack. Unicorn feels like a valid sequel-like interpretation. And F-91 does as well to me perfectly. Like in terms of like, I can see that as a future post Char's Counterattack. The, even like the stuff about how the mobile suits shrink, that's actually contextualized very well in that movie um, yeah. and in its expanded, especially like in Crossbone Gundam and its expanded material. So it's just, if if you were to tell me though, you have to go Shars Counterattack Unicorn, then F-91 and everything, that does not really work for me as much as like, you've just kind of got a head headcanon for yourself a Zelda split timeline, I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, if depending on how far we go with Gundam, there's going to be lots of weird timeline discussions with some like other like, shows in the future yeah. that will get very confusing um when you try to like combine different stuff together um yeah like honestly like for me um f91 and victory gundam effectively feel like because this is more or less what they were they're like the they set the template for what the au gundam would become like they 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 kind of set up a this is how you can continue to do gundam removed from the things that we know it's just sort of still technically clung on to the timeline from the previous things just because there's no reason to make that hard of a break um but then once you have g gundam which is technically the first au gundam show which i always love thinking about the fact that the first time they went through something that was not set in the universal century they went for what if we did <laughs> weird like dragon ball gundam bullshit this is like perfect yes exactly <laughs> and because then it's that and then i think it's gundam wing which is much more normal um, relatively speaking. It's so and funny because so, I think Gundam Wing sounds like what the first AU should have been, but I love yes. that the first one, and it makes sense because G Gundam was 94, so Dragon Ball is like at its literal height of Japanese popularity um, that they would do that, but it's so fucking funny that Gundam Wing was technically the second, that was the second like sober return to form. <laughs> yeah, and so, yes. Yeah. So for me, F91 and Victory Gundam are sort of like siloed off a little bit as that that is the, the because they are in communication with one another, especially if you put Crossbone in the middle. And so that feels like it's kind of its own continuity in, in its own little way yeah. in the full scope of Gundam. Whereas Unicorn Gundam is so closely attached to Char's counterattack to that it feels like Unicorn is clearly a direct continuation of, of the stuff we've talked about so far on this podcast. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about Narrative Gundam. Um, quick backstory. So as I said, Unicorn Gundam was a light novel series. 
the light novels, there were 10 books that were published for Unicorn Gundam. And then um, that was a very popular series while it was going on. So there were multiple other like side stories written. Those were compiled after the fact, I think in 2016 into an 11th book. That book was called um, Unicorn Gundam Phoenix Hunting because the main story in it is called Phoenix Hunting. And that is what was adapted into Narrative Gundam. There's other material in that book that is not in this movie, and it's a pretty heavily adapted version of it, to my understanding, because the book Phoenix Hunting takes place simultaneously with the end of Unicorn Gundam, whereas the movie jumps ahead and has it be a year forward and does involve Banerjee and Minova in small parts at, at certain points in the movie, which they would not be in the book. Um, yeah. So Narrative Gundam is a year forward. It's 0097. Um, and in this book, we are, or in this story, in this film, we are following three characters who in, in kind of the lore are the miracle children. They are three kids who back in 0079, um, there was this one girl, Rita, they were all like elementary school kids. And she is a new type who had some kind of flash of the future. And her friends, Michelle and Yona were both there with her and they all saw the colony drop before it happened. And so they became somewhat famous and known by the governments because they were the only ones who foresaw the colony drop as like literal um, premonition. And they were tested on for a number of years after that, sort of in the different cyber new type programs. We pick up in 0097 where Michelle is the leader of a faction in the Federation government. She is going after a mobile suit called the Phoenix, which is the third of the Unicorn Gundam line. There was the RX-0, the Unicorn Gundam, and then there is the Banshee, and the third is the Phoenix, which is a big, cool yellow suit with big, like, metal tails. I'm actually not sure how the physics of that work, but it's cool. Um, and the Phoenix Gundam is out there in this in space flying around. No one really knows what's going on with it. Uh, Michelle has employed Yona as the mobile suit pilot who is flying the suit called the Narrative Gundam, which is a cool mobile suit. We can talk about that later. Not my favorite Gundam, but it's fine. And um, Yona pilots the, the Narrative Gundam. They're going to try to find it. Uh, and that's kind of the setup for Narrative Gundam. And then a lot of stuff goes down after that. Um, and what I just explained, and this is important to understanding the movie Narrative Gundam, I just explained that in a fairly concise chronological fashion. The movie Narrative Gundam takes place pretty much out of order. There is a core um, like spine that is the hunt for the Phoenix. But within that, you have lots of flashbacks and side flashes and all sorts of things to kind of fill you in on this. And it's not really until the end of the movie you have it all pieced together. So it's definitely a movie where you kind of spend most of it kind of um, not fully clear on what's going on. It's stylistically very similar to Unicorn Gundam. It's a movie, so a little bit higher budget. There's certainly some really impressive animation and action sequences. Um it is definitely similar to Unicorn Gundam, and it feels like the side story it is, which is to say, I don't think it adds a ton to the universe that Unicorn Gundam did not do. I liked it, though, and I think, one, I do think it's an impressive production. Two, I think the specific thematic thing it hones in on is the nature of death in a world where we have the new types we have seen. Because the whole idea is that Michelle has come up with a theory that... She knows, as we have seen, something of new types lingers after death. She thinks something of that is imprinted on the phoenix and wants to capture the phoenix to try to find a way to immortality through new type science. Uh, and Rita, we find out at the end of the movie, has been dead the entire time and her spirit is animating the phoenix. So this goes really hard on the metaphysics shit. It's very much about the nature of death and the afterlife in a world where we have the new types we have seen. All that stuff worked for me, and I think this movie has an amazing final 15 minutes that moved me very much. So ultimately, I liked it. I'm not going to say it's the most essential piece of Gundam, but certainly, given how much I loved Unicorn, I really liked this as well. But that's my little spiel on it. What about you, Sean? Yeah, I I wouldn't say that I dislike it, but I, I, didn't, I didn't like it that much. And I think part of my... I think if this is part of like why I'm more lukewarm on this and why I'm not as enthusiastic about Unicorn as you, Jonathan, is partially, like, having seen, like, so much Gundam stuff that, like... I mean, some of the stuff that Unicorn Gundam does... Like, Unicorn Gundam pulls very directly from stuff like Gundam Seed um, in ways that, like... I think this is one of the reasons why I, like, am not as enthusiastic on it. And Narrative Gundam feels also, like... Okay, yeah, like, you know, it's doing its own thing, but it also feels like 
a, a little bit Gundam paint by numbers. Like it feels, a, it, it doesn't feel like it's kind of charting out its own course, which Unicorn Gundam, while Unicorn does pull things from stuff like Gundam Seed and, and a lot of those ideas and After War Gundam X and kind of does its own stuff with it, Unicorn Gundam still does feel a lot like it is pushing into its own territory and has its own identity. I think it is the the sense of like narrative Gundam um, retreading some of the same ground that Unicorn Gundam already covered and then also not having enough time to flesh out its own characters, leaving them feeling like Gundam archetypes um, that don't kind of like stand on their own too well. I think that's mostly my main issue with it. That and I, I'm, you know, we, we literally just talked about this, but like the new type stuff of like literalizing the new type ghost thing too much is something that I'm I'm not a big fan of doing. Like, there's a whole speech that Michelle Luo gives in the middle part of the movie that, like, goes into, like, how people become new type ghosts. And I'm like, I'm not sure I ever want characters to really directly acknowledge the fact that people are becoming actual ghosts. Um, like, other than, like, very vaguely people being like, like, Amro saying, I can't go out into space. The ghost of Lala Soon is waiting for me there. Like... I'm fine with that because it's weird and cryptic and you don't know if he means it literally or if he means it metaphorically. Like, what what does that mean for someone who's a new type? This movie just sort of very directly states and presupposes, like, no, people become literal actual ghosts when they die as new types. And I think, like, that's too much. And the plot of the movie's too hinged on that in a way that a very similar scene from Char's counterattack where uh, Hathaway says, like, oh new types learn to use the other half of their brains or whatever bullshit yeah. like which i think this movie also echoes that line specifically it's either this or you or gundam does it somewhere it's it's um, narrative gundam you're right yeah so it's like which is like that's a dumb line i do not like that line in shards counterattack but that line is also feels like it was put in by someone to be like a well, what if someone has literally never seen and knows nothing about Gundam and went to watch your movie? You have to have one line in there somewhere that explains something about what the magic powers are. I also um, think, and I do think you can put this on narrative Gundam a little bit, just because a character says it doesn't mean it's true, Hathaway is talking out his ass in that scene. Like, that's... this, Yes. And, like, I also think Michelle, like, part of the point of the end of narrative Gundam is she does not know as much as she thinks she knows. And, like, a lot of this is humans trying to pin down something that is beyond their comprehension. So I agree when people start talking about the science of it. I agree. I do not like that as much. I think you should leave that more vague. I also don't think either Narrative Gundam or that moment in Char's Counterattack are trying to tell you this is gospel that is scientifically true. Because the characters are humbled by it at certain points. Uh, sure. I think... For me, that works better in Shard's counterattack where it's Hathaway trying to impress a girl he has a crush on. Yeah. It works less well in Narrative Gundam when it is the... This is our military briefing scene yes. where like we are being told this is the mission we're on. And like you have to, as an audience member, there's a certain amount of like trust you have in those scenes to be like, this is something that is true, at least to a certain extent. Um, and because... like the stuff that she says about new type ghosts are not things that you can like really deny based on yeah. having watched Gundam. Like if you, if you like interrogate it too closely, it's hard to say that people do not literally become ghosts when you like cut to a sh scene from Zeta Gundam where the image of like four peers in front of the Zeta Gundam or whatever, or like Pudu in double Zeta because they repeatedly cut to the different times that ghosts have manifested in Gundam. So I think like narrative leans really hard on that in a way that makes it difficult for me to dismiss it as something that the show is saying, this is something that this character believes that we don't necessarily want you, the audience member, to believe. Here's how I view it. Just just nuance it a little more. I think it's like midi-chlorians in Star Wars. I think it's, sure. it's a thing where I think the midi-chlorian moment in Phantom Menace, you and I have talked about this on our main show, the Weekly Stuff Podcast. Go subscribe and listen and rate and review. Um, that I think we both think that moment is pretty broadly misunderstood. But what it is, is that it is trying to say, okay, if the force exists, what is a scientific mechanism by which it is seen and measured? That's what Qui-Gon is telling you. And I think some people, not unreasonably, interpret that as taking the mysticism out of the force. The thing is, if there is a force, of course it is scientifically observable. That's just, that's how things work in our world, right? Um, and so the midi-chlorians moment, I don't think takes 
the mysticism out of it. I think it is, in some ways, it can actually be read as reading more into it. I think Narrative Gundam has, but but it does get into a problem where, like, there's a point where if you tell the story long enough, you have to have a midichlorians moment. And I think Narrative Gundam, if, if there's anything that, that you can take away from it, from, like, a Gundam's future perspective, it's that I don't know how many more stories you can tell in a post-Unicorn Gundam world because you are going to have to start telling those speeches, right? Like... If, mm-hmm. if the Earth military is going after a Gundam that is animated by the spirit of someone, you can't ignore that there's a scientific phenomenon going on there. And so someone has to talk about it. And kind of how I see it is, I think what Michelle is saying is true and accurate in so much as what can be observable for what we've seen now. The part of it where I think the movie calls her on her bullshit a little bit is the belief that she can then capture it and pin it down and all of this is observable in a model. And she can, put, like, that's the part where it's like, She's giving an explanation for what we've seen so far, how that works into a future where things are still shifting is different. Um, but it's just, you know, there is a point where, as you say, like with with uh, Banerjee, once he has, by the swipe of his hand, dismissed an entire group of Gundams, there's, there's not much more you can go into that story because you can't ignore that that happened. That's what I kind of mean by it. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's again, like, I... I don't think that it like just that that element destroys narrative Gundam. It's just one of those things where it's like, man, if you cut out probably about like 70% of this speech, it would work fine for you. Like you did. It's, it spends so much time. And again, it's like the repeated cutting to scenes we've seen from older Gundam shows that have the new type stuff in it is like, you're there. You're trying too hard for it. It's, you know, which is, the Phantom Menace thing with the midichlorians is like a pretty one-off scene that is just two characters sitting down and talking. It's not as like produced as yeah. that, that sequence in the middle of this movie is. Yeah. And it's not my favorite part of narrative Gundam. My favorite part of narrative Gundam is the last 15 minutes. I think the closing fight is really good. And then the sequence where Yona is like summoned into the astral plane or whatever you want to call it and meets Michelle and Rita again. And there's a, insert song played there called cage that i have not been able to stop listening to because it is such a fucking amazing song and i think that moment of of him seeing his friends them all accepting death thinking about the next step and then he gets pulled back into the real life by banerjee who comes in for a cameo at the end that moment really gets me it's part of just you put a good song and some powerful images together you will get me every time i'm very synesthetic that way uh, but then I do also like the way Banerjee comes in at the end and, you know, Yona is very despondent because he's lost everyone he ever cared about. And Banerjee, in something we did not talk about, he kind of has a weird catchphrase in that he's constantly yes. saying in Unicorn Gundam the words Sore Demo, which they translate, you can translate that in a bunch of ways, but it's like... Um, what how do they translate it i've only thought of it as uh, i even so, even so, so is it's like it, yeah. it's yeah so it's it's him constantly like say like someone will say something to him like zinnerman or full frontal will say something about like to the effect of like we shouldn't try to change this thing we shouldn't try to for like the optimal solution or like for like the optimistic approach because the world isn't that like soft young boy or yeah. whatever you know and kind of like stamp him down a little bit and then every time they do that he says so they demo like b- even so like even if what you're saying is true that doesn't mean we shouldn't yes. try to push for the optimal solution and that's kind of his catchphrase and he, yes he has his catchphrase he says it it's like one of his only lines of dialogue, which I thought was very funny, is he says Sore Day. Well, and it's a really too. beautiful little moment because it actually, it's like, okay, Banerjee's still being out there in the world and using that kind of experience to like comfort this other pilot who's gone through a weird experience. I really like that moment at the end. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I agree that uh, Narrative Gundam, I wish it had more time to spend with its characters. It is a 90 minute movie. Anime is made in like chunks of time, obviously. So like, you're either going to get a 90 minute movie or a two hour movie. They got a 90 minute movie. I think this movie should have been two hours because there are points where they have to do so much story stuff in such like concentrated bits of time. It gets pretty gibberishy. And like, I understand it now having watched the movie and thought about it, but I do think a two hour narrative Gundam would be a stronger version of itself. Um, but I still liked it and I would recommend it. Um, 
but it definitely it is not at the same level as as Unicorn necessarily. Although it does have Hiroyuki Sawano doing the music again, the music is amazing. There's another insert song called uh, Vigilante that plays during the first battle in the movie that is just fucking great. Uh, I listen to that song a lot these days now too. Um, yeah, and you know honestly, my biggest complaint about this movie, Sean, Narrative Gundam is a fun title for a Gundam movie. They could have called this movie Mobile Suit Gundam Phoenix Hunting. And that would have been such a good movie title. I kind of regret that just slightly. I understand why they had to do the narrative naming scheme because they're always titled after the the suit. Although they could have called it Mobile Suit Phoenix Gundam as well, which would have been cool. Yeah. Yeah, because it is, you know, I, I do think the movie is worth watching. Um, it, but like it does, it, like when I watched it, I couldn't escape this feeling of like a boy. If this was, if this was like a full fifty episode TV show with the the main character setup in particular, I think is really good. Yeah. Like if you can imagine a show where you follow Yona, Michelle, and Rita as kids, and then they start growing up, like a vaguely like it would be sort of like what Iron Blooded Orphans does. Um, but then you have the kids split off into three different factions. Um, like one of them you know, going to like a vaguely Zeon side and one of them doing like a sort of Earth Federation. Like there's a lot of potential in that kind of setup they have um, with those three main characters. That's very cool. And you just never quite kind of spend quite enough time with any one of them to fully buy, um, buy those characters and like kind of get fully invested in their character development. Like it, it is bolstered a lot by the really good production values and the great music. I think sells more than what the movie actually has That's to fair, kind yeah. of give you. Um, that being said, there is stuff in it that I do like a lot. Like, I, I agree with you that I like the ending a lot. Um, I think that you do a good job of just giving you a little bit of Banaji. Um, he gets to say his catchphrase, and it's like, yeah, that's good. Like, that was the right amount. Um, cause I was worried when he started to like, they hinted that he was going to come in. I was really worried we were going to get a see destiny situation where Banaji would just show up and save the day. And like our protagonist for this movie would just not solve the movie. And it's like, that's a very unsatisfying thing to do in a story. Um, but they, they use the right amount of him. There's a good couple of scenes with Mineva that I like a lot. Um, you get a little bit of Zinnerman. And so that's good. Um, I do really like the mid movie action scene in the colony. Oh, I think that so whole section so good. Like it's a great action sequence. The character who has a great name, Zoltan Akinen, who is the like failed full frontal, like he's like a bad batch shark clone or something. Um, great night name. I like that character. Um, and I think he's he's fun. It's just in like how kind of like unhinged he is and kind of pushing this conflict in an area that it doesn't doesn't need to be. Um and 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 again I like I like the setup in the premise and I like a lot of the stuff of like seeing the flashbacks of them as kids. It's just that I think the movie doesn't fully kinda ever like really congeal for me. Alright. Well, no worries. I liked it and you liked parts of it, and it's okay. Uh we can both agree Unicorn's great. And oh, yes, yeah. hopefully we can also agree the Phoenix is just a fucking cool mobile suit that I have on my Gunpla wish list. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I would love at some point to do a set of the Phoenix, the Banshee, and the Unicorn, because those are three really damn good mobile suits. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think that's it for this week, Sean. Anything else to say about Unicorn and or Narrative Gundam? Um, since you were talking about mobile suits, it reminded me one thing I do very like that Narrative Gundam does is there's the the part where Yona first comes in and is piloting mobile suits. And I think it's when they kidnap... Do they kidnap Stephanie Luo? Yes. Um, what if they, yeah, they take one of the characters. Um, and he is piloting the DJ, which is the mobile suit that Amuro has in Zeta Gundam that looks like a blue Rick Diaz with like weird um, wings on the back. He is piloting that, and that, and that mobile suit has only ever been in, like, a couple of episodes of Zeta Gundam. And I thought it was very funny that that's, like, they went to that one. And I'm like, yeah, that's, a, that's a totally fine mobile suit. And it was like, I like that he's piloting that, and it's not just, like, a, here's some, like, a mobile, a Gundam Mark II, or he's piloting a Nemo, or, like, whatever random other Earth Federation. And they go to the DJ, and I'm like, yeah, good, yes. I like when we can get more obscure mobile suits from old shows and get them in like really nice modern animation with like a movie budget. That's if you're going to keep on going back to the universal century stuff, keep on like pluck out like weird little mobile suits. Like next time, if they do another one of these, get a good Bawu. Like I want to, I want to see the Bawu again. We got a DJ. Give me another Bawu. That's what I want. I love the Bawu. 
All right. So next time on Weekly Suit Gundam, we will be talking Mobile Suit Gundam F91 moving forward in the Universal Century, but back in time to the 1990s, 1991 to be precise, when yep. Tomino tried to get another Gundam franchise off the ground. And it didn't go so well, but we got a really weird movie out of it. And Yeah, so that is important context for people who have not seen F91. If you are watching along with us as we're making podcasts, I you, you must go into F91 knowing that that movie was originally designed um, in production. It was going to be a full 50-episode anime show. Um, they got like about a third or fourth of the um, scripts written. It was about 12 or 13 scripts done. Um, and then the show got canned. Um, then Tomino kind of lobbied to get the what they had done and kind of projected for the show to be made into a movie. And so that's what the movie is. And I knew that going into it. Jonathan, you knew that going into it. And I think it is important to see that movie knowing that it was originally going to be a full anime TV show and they turned it into a film. And, and that allows you to, I think, kind of wave away and in some ways kind of enjoy the weird pacing and like all over the placeness of the entire middle like hour of that movie basically is nutso. Um, but that movie has a bunch of great stuff in it. Um, and even where it's bad, I love the ways that it's bad because it's so it's so crazy. It's so crazy. I'm excited to talk about that and at least uh, give some of my impressions of Crossbow and Gundam. I don't know if you'll have read that by then, but I want to talk it, just because I've been reading so much of it and I have some little thoughts, probably non-spoilery to share. But uh, it's fascinating as well. And then after that, we'll be moving on to uh, Mobile Suit Victory Gundam, Sean. Yeah, and then who knows... Who knows from there? Like you're all, you're watching Gundam faster than we can put out podcasts at this point, Jonathan. We so. are. <laughs> That's why so. right now I've been like I have not watched any Gundam since F ninety one. I've been reading Crossbone Gundam feverishly, but this is giving us some time to build back up so I can like start Victory Gundam and that's fifty episodes again, so we can build up some time. It'll be good. Yeah, and I will try to rewatch Victory Gundam as well because I I have been wanting to watch it, so I will try to get that We'll try to plan the podcast such that we can both watch that show by the time we get there. But, you know, that's for the future. For next time, we'll watch Gundam F91, you know, and boy, Gundam sure is good. And and I am sure fucking excited to watch more of it. (laughs) 